Welcome to the Great Base Podcast, episode 94. I'm Steve Smith, along with Roberto Calla. We're in Boynton Beach, Florida. We're at the FM Tennis Performance Center. Today, we're going to interview Chad Burial. Looking forward to that. I know Roberto and I both spent uh, five years with Chad. But I watched a hockey game today, so before we start, let me ask you a soccer question, Roberto. All right, Steve. Go ahead. When, when you came, it's racial. I mean, I, I want to be politically correct, but when you came over here from South America, and you played soccer for the first time with all these gringos. Why were you so nervous? Why were you so uptight? Um, I can end up in the hospital. They don't know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Actually, the, the roughest form of hockey, I remember my father being upset with one of my older brothers. I, I weighed less than 100 pounds, and he, he, he put me in a beer league hockey game. Pretty rough, but the roughest hockey was when I worked as a lines person in intramural college hockey, pickup hockey, and the players can't stop. <laughs> They're waving their sticks. But now yeah, let's get Chad on the phone. We've known Chad a long time. He's a college coach. I think he might have been one of the youngest, if not the youngest, head coach. Uh, amazing skill set. Um, he's at St. Leo University. I know. I look it up uh, this year. At one time, the teams were both ranked um, three in the country with... Uh, but, um, yeah, we just get Chad on the phone and uh, remind him of uh, so many things, and he can update us on what's going on. But Plus, we need to give out some value here, some tennis information, some ideas, some insights. Yeah. And ring-a-ling-ling. -ling. There's one. Hello. Chatty baby, Steve Smith, Roberto Cowell. Looking forward to talk to you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. My English, looking forward to talking to you. <laughs> Actually, the best way to say that is in, in writing an email is um, speaking with you, not speaking to you. There um, you go. With, uh, I want to go back to the beginning, but tell us right now, St. Leo University. Tell us a little bit about the place, where it is. Yeah, St. Leo University, we are uh, we're actually in St. Leo, Florida. Uh, it's a very small town right next to San Antonio, Florida, an even smaller, well, not smaller town, but still uh, a town we call Mayberry. Um, but we're, we're about 35 minutes north of downtown Tampa, right next to Dade City and, and very close to Wesley Chapel. Yeah, I've been on your campus several times. I think it's a, you used to say it was a postcard, now you have to say it's a screensaver. Very pretty campus. Yeah, it was it was made to, to to look like a resort. It definitely has that that touch to it. Um, yeah, beautiful beautiful place. Uh, good academics, obviously in Florida. Good good weather, and we've had uh, some very competitive tennis teams here as well. So yeah, it's been a good good landing spot. With St. Leo, one time maybe they still do. They had the largest internet enrollment. Is that still the case? They they did. They were really. Um, in the forefront um, with online education, they were one of the, the very first uh, universities to offer an online MBA. Uh, now, you know, almost every school offers online courses or online graduate programs, but yeah, St. Leo kind of made its mark uh, through the online, and then they established these uh, centers around the United States, so we had satellite campuses across the across the u.s so they were very forward thinking about 10 years ago of how to um, make the campus bigger so we have a campus enrollment of around 2700 students but uh in a normal year we're, we're our enrollment's really around 16,000 between the online the centers and our, our university campus and there's a school out west that your university purchased is that right well, they were in talks for that. Yeah, it was uh, I think it was called Marymount University, just outside LA. Those talks have fell through, um, so that's not a not a property we're going for anymore. But it, it, it did for a long time look like that they were going to acquire that university. I just, just think from a still with the fallout with the pandemic, it's going to be, be be tough to a, a tough go. Let's bring Roberto in here, the Peruvian. You know where Michigan is, Peru uh, Roberto? 
think so. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna guess that Roberto doesn't know this one. When you meet someone from Michigan, you have to put your palm up and say, where are you from? Uh, why don't you start with that? Where are you from in Michigan? I'm from uh, I'm from Lansing, Michigan. So yeah, if you put uh, put your right palm up, we're pretty much right near the center of your palm, right in the middle of the state. You notice he said right palm because you can't be wrong if you're from Michigan. It's got to be the right. The it's right got to be the right palm. Yeah, right, the right palm. And uh, there's part of Michigan where if you uh, you go south, you land in Canada. That's right. You can go through. Uh, you can go south of Detroit and end up uh, end up in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. So yeah, you can uh, go south in Michigan to get to Canada. That's correct. Um, Michigan uh, has more coastline than California. So you didn't know that's that. That's true. No. <laughs> With uh, no, there's a place down here in, in Boynton Beach called Detroit Pizza, and uh, we recently had a father, mother. They don't. They live in, in Dallas now. They were visiting with their daughter, plays tennis, and he told me he's from Detroit. So I stopped by that place and got him some Verners. The, uh, there you go. Uh, it's supposed to be medicinal, right? Is it? It's like a ginger ale, Roberto. Yeah. It's only it's ginger only ale. If you're from Michigan, you know that. Actually, I probably should have got some last week because if you're from Michigan and you're feeling a little bit under the weather, uh, instead of taking any medication, you just drink a Verner. Is that with or without rum? <laughs> Preferably without, but whatever your style is, I guess that's fine. With, uh, yeah, so we could do this maybe three sections. We're um, talking about your time uh, starting out in basketball, becoming a tennis junkie, and ending up spending some years with us. That'd be the second part, and then all the years since. I, uh, yeah. In introducing you, I said uh, we'd cover so much just with our conversation, but. I think you might have been the youngest head coach when you started with us in the country. I think so. Yeah. yeah not, I mean, it'd be hard to beat. We go. You're 22 or 23? 22. 22 years old. Um, yeah. So tell us about your your upbringing. You start started tennis. Yeah. So I I had finished uh, my freshman year playing high school basketball, and I was approached by uh, our our junior varsity coach. He he would refer to himself as the real Bob Barker. Um, Coach, Coach Barker you know, came to me and said, hey, Chad, what are you going to do in the off season to, to get ready to play JV basketball next year? And I said, I, I, whatever you want me to do, Coach, I'll you know shoot in the driveway, I'll go lift, you know, whatever you want me to do. And he said, well, I, I'd love to see you play tennis. And uh, my reaction was not a very positive one to to him but he, he said well we practice tomorrow why don't you come on out and I think that evening I I went over to a our local Kmart or Walmart and, and and bought like a $25 tennis racket and came to practice the next day they uh in Michigan still in the high school season which was in the spring it was still too cold to go outside I think we still had snow on the court so we we started in the basketball gym and they uh, had one of the coaches at the time, Jeff Belding, who kind of showed me how to hit against the wall, and they just kind of let me do my own thing and definitely didn't have fun just hitting against the wall. But he really didn't understand what I was doing. But the last usually 30 to 45 minutes of our, our practice, we did conditioning, and normally the conditioning just turned into open gym for basketball. So uh, that really kept me, kept me going. Uh, I, I probably did that for maybe two weeks, and then we had our first match, and uh, they asked me to, to go to the match just to observe so they could kind of teach me how to score, um, how everything works, singles, doubles, everything. And uh, we were playing our, our, our rival school at the time, uh, Lansing Waverly, and went to the match. I, I really don't remember what happened. I, I think one of the guys couldn't come he was either sick or had an extracurricular that he had to take care of but they asked me to play um play in the match that day and so they said hey chad we'll put you with a senior uh we'll put you at the last double spot and you know just try your best and uh, i remember playing in that match and 
uh, my partner and I, we ended up, we ended up winning the match in, in three sets and I just kind of stayed really close to the net and just tried to act like I was dunking the tennis ball uh, as much as I could around the net. And then uh, he ended up keeping us at that double spot. And then at the end of the year, we had our, our end of the end of the year banquet. And the coach said, well, I, I give out our most valuable players based on winning percentage. So Mike Lovato and Chad Berryhill, you are our, our tennis most valuable players. And I thought that was, I thought that was so funny but that's really what kept me into the sport um, was just getting in through basketball and trying to please my basketball coach. And then it ended up pre- being pretty, pretty fun from there. And then uh, I was lucky enough uh, in the summertime, I didn't really make the connection the first summer, but the coach also would take players to Harris State University's summer camp. So I ended up doing that for three summers in a row. And I don't know why the first two summers I never heard about the professional tennis management program at Ferris State, but that finally connected in the third summer. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of how it got me going is just through through our basketball coach inviting me out to a tennis practice. So you were in grade nine. Great, yeah, grade great grade nine when I first started. I had never, I think, one time on like a vacation to Florida. Uh, my dad and my uncle and aunt, like we were messing around on the tennis court for 20 or 30 minutes, just, you know, tapping the ball around. But other than that, I had never played until, until that first practice. Uh, tell us about Ferris State. Yeah, Ferris State, um, you know, I, uh, that third summer that I went to camp, there were some other campers that also mentioned that they were going to go into the, the professional tennis management or the PTM program. And they were talking about it um, at the camp. I, I thought it was kind of neat. I, I knew I wanted to do something related to sports, um, looking at it, looking into college. And I thought really I was going to go more like in athletic training, but I, I knew like anatomy and physiology was really going to be my thing. Uh, so I came back from the camp. I, I thought that sounded kind of neat. Um, there was a coach there at the time too, uh, named David Ramos, uh, who's now with the USTA. Um, and, and, and I talked to Dave a little bit about it while I was there. And then, um, during, I guess during that fall, uh, my parents and I went up and we met with the, the PTM director at the time, which who was RJ Tessier. And he, after that meeting with RJ, I was, I was completely sold into, into going into PTM and starting there that, that, that fall, that following fall, um, as a freshman learning how to be a tennis coach and learning the business side of tennis. So I was really excited about going up there and, and starting. It's just interesting. You know, Dave Ramos is a very positive guy. I'm sure that was a, just that a very positive conversation. Um, how many directors were there? You started with under uh, R.J. Tessier, then. Um... Yeah, R.J. was um, he was there for my first year. Um, the founder of the program, uh, Scott Schultz, he was still there at the time. He he was with the program, but also he had this other um, sector that he worked for with the university called Auxiliary Enterprises. Um, so he kind of went back and forth doing those two things. And then um, RJ had left to take a, a, a job, uh, I believe, with the USPTA in Houston at the time, which was like a dream dream position for him. Uh, so then Tom Douglas uh, replaced RJ, and I had Tom uh, the last three years that I was there. Yeah, that's right, RJ. I remember he uh, when he left there, he had an instrumental role with the USPTA test. Yes. With um, and how much uh, time you spent around Scott Schultz? He was the founder, correct? Yeah, he was the founder, and um, Scott also um, is from Lansing, Michigan. When we when I played my first match, I mentioned Lansing Waverly. That's that's actually the school that Scott Schultz attended. So we had a we had a kind of a fun little rivalry between each other because I went to Grand Ledge High School and he went to Lansing Waverly. Um, but yeah, Scott was Scott was there uh, periodically. I mean, 
I, I definitely remember him showing up at some of the uh, the PTM classes that we took. Um, he'd show some things on court or, or whatever, but really RJ um, did the majority of the work. And then um, I, I want to say maybe in my junior year, uh, Scott left and took the position with the USTA. So he wasn't around as much, but, um, but yeah, he was def- def- definitely involved. He, uh, he always loved talking about the program and helping us on court and things like that. Um, but RJ and Tom were definitely the instrumental pieces there. I know Scott just recently, uh, retired. I'm not sure that might be the wrong word, resigned. He was with USTA for a long, long time after being at Ferris State. And then yeah. he, he was leading the USTA U, USTA University program. Yes. With, um, but that, for our listeners, Ferris State was the first four-year program, PTM program, professional tennis management. Tyler Junior College that I was part of, um, they had classes starting in 74, one class a semester. It was, an, it was a minor. It was an emphasis. And in 81, um, I was given the, the privilege to revise that into a, a comprehensive degree program. But now, Tyler Junior College is no longer in existence. Um, Methodist, we, young man who's completed an, actually two different internships with us, um, he just graduated and they have 33 people in their program, so that means basically eight per class. How, how is Fair State doing now, enrollment-wise, do you know? Yeah, I mean, last I, last I checked in, I, I, I think that they're, uh, that, that they're struggling more than they had before. When, when I was a student, I, we normally had between I would say 60 and 80 students. Um, I think now they're they're definitely less than less than 20. I think there there might even be around uh, 15 students uh, there. Um, in total. They, 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 in, in total, yeah, in total. Yeah, I mean the the concept, uh, the mission, it's great. I mean, I, I know I was there three times. Um, when you were working uh, 25 hours a day with us, uh, as a bonus, I took you up to uh, Ferris because you had such great love for Ferris State. On that particular trip, I got to see a hockey game. But um, So you're there four years. I remember you were the um, club president. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was uh, our, our, our PTM Student Association president uh, twice. Uh, I, I was elected in my... Uh, sophomore year and also senior year so that, that was a great opportunity it, it really what the student association did is we um we helped create different events uh for the local community and in turn uh the ptm students would volunteer and get involved with those activities um we did we did a lot of different things. I think the probably the biggest thing that we did, which was also a fundraiser for the student association, is we did uh, we did a thing called Kids Night Out, where we just have kids come to the our racket facility and we had racquetball, we had tennis going on, we had a lot of different activities. But uh, but yeah, it was really a way to get involved and kind of create your own niche within the program and and. Come with come with different ideas to really get involved, and like you said, I had I did not have much experience with tennis before going up there. So for me, it was great to be the the, the president and kind of control what things I wanted to learn or people that I wanted to talk to or events that I wanted more experience with. Um, but yeah, the, the student association. I think a lot of people would look back at their time there and, and really appreciate that time. We met we met every week. Uh, Thursday at 11 o'clock in the College of Business and it was the time for us really to connect with uh, the director. They would have a speaking part there, whoever the the secretary was, the, the tennis team coaches. I mean, everyone was there and updating us on everything that was going on uh, within the program. So it was, uh, it, it, was it was very nice every week. I remember uh, very, very seldom did we actually ask for resumes, but we put it out that we uh, we're looking for, you know, to fill a position, and part of it was being an assistant coach. Uh, I know that you never, you came in to be the assistant coach, but from day one you were the head coach. But Roberto said something to me uh, 
that I totally forgot that when you first came, it was spring break. Remember that? Yeah, actually, um, um, I was the first uh, first day when the child uh, came. He was with two friends, and yeah. we were in the classroom. That's true, uh, uh, Chad. That's that's true. Yeah, I actually, um, I was getting you know that going up to spring break. I was getting a little bit frustrated with the job search, so I was talking with a good friend of mine, Kyle Lacroix, and Kyle's from uh, from Tampa originally. He was helping to look at some jobs online, and he said, hey, there's this job um, at Hillsborough Community College with the Tennis Smith School. Have you ever heard of Steve Smith? No, I hadn't. Um, hey, you should come check it out. So I reached out to Steve, and Steve got back to me. Um, like, yeah, we can definitely want to talk about it. And I said, hey, my my two roommates and I, uh, a guy by the name Joel Disbro and Steve Friedman, um, we're going to be down on spring break in Tampa. So Steve inv- invited us uh, to stop by uh, one of the days. Uh, Steve was out of tennis at that time. And then Joel um, actually, he actually worked uh, for Wilson and the basically the product design team. He was helping with, uh, designing the rackets every year and I know that he was stringing all the grand slams and and things like that but yeah my first my first experience with you all was uh, was on, on on spring break in the classroom I think I definitely remember Steve uh, brain typing us pretty early on yeah. uh, so that was kind of fun to do with with, do with our roommates and uh, but yeah I got to meet you guys for the first time then no I remember that I we'll have to come back to the brain typing now uh, I think it was a rainy day, but because we usually are at, those start in the classroom. But that's uh, we use the um, the quiz. The, John Neenagle made it all the way to the cover of Tennis Magazine. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Kyle. He's been a guest. He's a uh, outstanding tennis teaching professional. He's based in Boca. Uh, you hear his name quite often because of the work he does, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I want to backtrack and ask you a question. Uh, you told me your favorite class. You had a chance four-year program which is business marketing degree right yes it is that um you had a chance to take some electives in your favorite class if i'm not mistaken was uh watching movies and you know studying the movie yeah they 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 had i can't remember the exact name of this class but it was uh i don't know it wasn't like movie appreciation but it was in this class where you would watch a movie in at the end of the end of the class, it was an evening class. Uh, the professor would give this timeline of the movie, and we would watch different genres. And they would, you know, kind of talk about different parts of the movie or key times that made this genre or whatever. And I just remember, you know, we talked about it a little bit before the movie, and then we recap afterward. But it was uh, it was amazing class. I mean, yeah, you can never watch a movie the same way again after taking that class it just you you got you got a chance to really catch things that you probably otherwise would never would never find or or catch while watching a movie so it was a a very neat class and i ran a a program for tennis teachers i was back in the day of blockbuster and you'd go find the blockbuster store and you could you know rent movies and we would assign a um you know, say, uh, you know, it could have been a Rocky, it could have been this, could have been that. There were so many movies. They weren't all sports movies, but they were all certainly uplifting, motivational movies. And I think one of the reasons to do it was uh, have the college students drink less beer because I would, you know, give them a quiz on Monday to see if they watched the movie over the weekend. So I knew that the, you know, and I got the reports that, you know, there'd be 20 kids in a room watching the movie. Everybody would be quiet, be quiet. We're going to be tested on this. We're going to be tested on this. So the, the the low to high swallow through the twelve ounce curls, uh, hopefully you started a little bit later and, and they didn't drink so much beer. And I, I, w- I, w- I would have been one to know if they were getting in trouble because so many times uh, I had to go bail somebody out of the Tyler Texas jail with uh, Dave Nostrand. Tell us about Dave Nostrand, another Michigander. Yeah, Dave Nostrand. Um, I, I I met him for the. For the first time, he actually we so every every year we have a um, an annual banquet, PTM banquet, where the alumni come back and we uh, 
we had a, a long standing uh, partnership with Wilson with PTM program. So Wilson would always have a keynote speaker come in. And uh, I, I don't I remember two of the years we had Peter Burwash. Um, one of the years we had uh, Tim Gullickson. And then one of the years we had Vic Braden come. Uh, and, and Dave accompanied Vic, um, another Michigander, on the trip. And I remember when I was meeting with Dave that we were, I was looking for a summer internship. Um, I was talking with Dave about it, and he's, you know, he's like, "Hey, if you if you come up and do this internship, I I guarantee you'll learn more about teaching tennis than you know any other internship that you could possibly come across." And I uh, was definitely very interested in it, but at the time, um, I, I guess the the internships that got more of the prestige were the the higher paying ones. So. I, I kind of blew Dave off thinking, hey, I just got to make some more money in the summer rather than, than learn more about tennis. I thought I was getting getting enough, but I, I, I couldn't have been more wrong. I definitely should have uh, took Dave up on his offer to go uh, work at, at work at the Big Braden Tennis College. And I don't remember the name of the location, but it was in, it was in northern Michigan where, uh, where, where Dave is going to be for the summer. Yeah, there's some connection. Dave, he, he attended Tennis Tech. Um, and then he, after that, he worked for Vic Braden. I know um, he's my age, so he had a lot to do with young Andy Fitzell, and Andy uh, started teaching tennis as a teenager. With um, when when Dave told you that that you would learn more, um, you know, we've heard that you know, gee, with our our podcast that we come across as a know it alls, so we're kind of tennis snobs, or you know, like this is the way, but. People just don't understand the fact-based side of it. The 19.1 degrees, you know, the, the dimensions of the court. Um, but I always, you know, greatly respected Ferris State. Um, and we, we could talk about there's so many people in the tennis industry. I want to get back. They're currently looking for a director, right? They are, yeah. They currently are. And, um, yeah, it definitely needs the... Uh a shot in the arm, the program, like I said, it was, um, you know, we had a lot of, a lot of students back in the day that would, would go. The camaraderie was great. Um, the, the networking was tremendous. Um, e e even now, I kind of joke with people when I go over to the USTA, it's like, yeah, well, the USTA is kind of run by Ferris State. There's so many Ferris State PTM alumni that, that are over there, but, um, but yeah, they're they're looking for a, a, a director now, and um, hopefully they find someone that can really help promote, get more students in, and then really, as you mentioned, can can get them more on the, on, on a fact based um, path down down tennis teaching. I think that would help keep more people uh, within the industry for sure. With yeah, the, the USTA, at one point, I was told there's 18 fair staters were working at Lake No. That was pre-pandemic. That's a, that's a very healthy number in, in working in all capacities um, yeah. at the USTA. With Colin Cadwell, tell us about Colin. I think he should be hired to be the PTM director. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would love to see that as well. Uh, I, I, I got a chance to actually, when Colin came to, to Ferris State for the first time. I got a chance to just show him around campus and uh, hit with him a little bit and try to convince him to come. And I think he was still still going back and forth and whether he was going to uh, make the commitment to, and, and come. Uh, Collins Reggie from, from Eagle, Idaho. Uh, but he did decide to come, and um, he was a good friend of mine throughout the program. He's just got a, a tremendous personality he's got great love for the game he can get anybody to laugh and enjoy the enjoy the sport and then um you know i was fortunate enough to go back to ferris state um as their head men's and women's tennis coach colin was already working there um as a, as the ptm administrator uh so it was fun to to be back on campus with him and i know he had uh got connected with with you and brought some brought some students down to uh, the Tampa area to to learn the the system and the Great Base, and I know that made a major impact 
um, on Colin. I, I think I remember telling you, Steve, the story that Colin and I would uh, quite frequently go out to have dinner or lunch or whatever, and we'd be sitting eating a pizza together and trying to talk about uh, forehands and backhands and what we had learned from a, a, a presenter or what we learned in class, and we both kind of had different uh, opinions on it. And then I, I remember always telling Colin that once we both had learned learned about the Great Base, I teased him like, "Yeah, both of us, neither one of us knew what we were <laughs> what we were talking about." Um, but uh, but yeah, he's a he's a great guy, and I, 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 he, he's actually back at Ferris State now. Um, he's not. He's not exactly working with the PTM program per se. Um, he's working with the racket facility as as, as their, I, b- I believe, as their head pro or at least one of their staff pros there. But he's already back on campus, and uh, I, I think he, he's already a, a tremendous asset to, to PTM. And he already knows how it works there with it, with having the tennis management being intertwined with a university, the College of Business our racket facility and how it was intertwined also with our intercollegiate tennis program. So yeah, he would be, he'd be a great hire for that program for sure. With first time I went, I was a a speaker for the banquet. Um, There was like four or five of us. Nick Saviano was the headliner. Um, I know Andy Fitzell has has gone up and been a presenter at at the, the PTM banquet. And the second time I went, you and I went up, and that's, uh, people go back and listen to our podcast with Steve Roberts. Um, and yeah. I think Steve was right. His name wasn't really pulled out of the hat, but it was pulled out of the hat, but it was fixed. I think you know he was like number three on the team, but he was in the, in the program. And then uh, let's take one of the best players, and we made a slow-motion analysis in front of the entire Ferris State um, student body. At that time, I think there was close to 50, 60 people. Um, and then the third time, um, Derek Emile, he was the director at the time. I was, I was placed on an advisory committee, not that that was of any significance. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people put together an advisory committee and they're really not active. But he had it approved where I ran a workshop. So I um, t- took 12 students and I'd say most of the the 10 were goal-oriented juniors from Chicago, but then it was uh, pulled out of the hat, and that was a fair deal. It was pulled out of the hat that two of the students could attend the workshop. And, but it was a typical college scenario where, you know, just a few of the Ferris State students, it was on the weekend, just a few of the Ferris State students came in and observed. You know, Colin, you know, he stayed for the entire, entire workshop. I mean, I'm just talking to a handful of kids for really a handful of minutes. And, you know, my fault first is I should have told Derek, I said, you know, um, we um, should have made this assignment. We should put teams together and, you know, put, you know, 10 on a team and one player has to come for this 30 minutes and the next person has to come for this 30 minutes. So we ran this workshop and really no one attended. Um, I remember taking Greg Lasour, who's a tennis teaching professional who spent three years with us. You, you were with us when he was an intern, correct? Yes, yes. And, um, but, you know, so we went on a Thursday and left on a Tuesday, and uh, they certainly needed some ideas, like we all do. Uh, like, say, if there's a P class with, with 20, 20 people, make it 20 privates. Um, but you, you had a different scenario where you had four indoor courts and lots of snow. And um, when I was at Tyler Junior College, we had 12 courts and very little snow. And it, was a di- it was a different curriculum, too. Um, but, the um, I think of Dave Bone, um, who I hired from Ferris State, and I was working for Tennis Corporation of America, and he was a very sharp guy. He was the administrative, you know, coordinator. But I think we plugged the resume called an administrative director, and very very talented in so many areas. And he was so proud of his Ferris State education and his USPTA level one. And I'm a member of the USPTA and don't want to be negative, but I said, well, now that you're here, you know, the same thing that Dave Nostrand told you, I told um, Dave Bone. I, I, when I, every, the three times I was at Ferris State, and that some people may not understand this at all, but each time I left, I had a sick feeling in my stomach. You know, young people, old people, 
people making career changes or taking college loans and they just weren't learning um, fact-based instruction. Um, but they were being taught to be professional. There's so, so, so many positives. But, um, you know, and I think all these years later, the USTAU, uh, I met with Scott Schultz uh, back when Lake Nona had more bulldozers than tennis balls. I mean, there was no tennis balls. And, you know, he was, said, well, we're going to you know, possibly put a committee together and have you know, five to seven people on the committee. And would like to have you be on the committee. And I said, um, didn't you ever hear that the good Lord made planet Earth in seven days and he turned it over to a committee? But I, at that time I said, and, and, and we're working towards having the Great Bays become a nonprofit and, and the lawyer we're working with, uh, I think she called it, you know, the more I describe what we do, it's, it's really a body of work. That's, that's really what it is. It's a study of tennis teaching. It's homework. Um, with, um, so uh, tell us about uh, your start with us. I mean, so you're, you graduate, you went, you, you went right from graduating to come and work with us, correct? Yeah, it was, um, I think I just, I think we're right in the middle of uh, trying to finish a high school season. Um, I think you were you were nice enough to let us kind of finish our season for the first time that the high school team has made the uh, um, state championship in over 30 years or whatever. So I finished up with that, and then uh, shortly after uh, made made the trip from uh, Big Rapids, Michigan, to, to Tampa, Florida, and. Um, like I said, when, when Kyle first, Kyle LaCroix first told me about the, the job, what really interested me about it was, you know, it had the, I really wanted to try to get into college coaching and uh, it had a really unique where it was going to be, you get to work with the, with the tennis Smith school um, and work with the academy and then also, um, Get to get to be the assistant women's coach for the Hillsborough Community College team. So, I thought that was a great way for me to get into into college coaching. I wasn't even really thinking at the time so much on the academy side. I'm like, hey, whatever, I can get into college coaching. Um, it ended up being the the best of both worlds. I think, like you said, I I was there for like a month before the the head coach resigned, and they were they pushed me in to be the head coach right away, and then. Um, I, when I first started with, with the tennis Smith school, um, I just really started observing. I remember you telling me, okay, you, you, you're going to have to observe first. You're not even, you're not even ready to help, help us do anything yet. <laughs> and I, and I didn't know what that meant, but the more that I observed the system and how everyone, uh, was being taught and, um, I, you were hundred percent right. I couldn't, I couldn't have helped anybody. I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough knowledge, even though I thought coming out of the the Ferris State PTM program, like, hey, I'm 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 good to go. Put me on the court, and I can beat some balls, run some drills, things like that. But little did I know, I had had a ton to learn. So it was a, a blessing in disguise that really I I took the job with tennis Smith School, really because of the college coaching position. But um, but yeah, I learned so so much being there for. For five years, learning under you, Roberto, and all the other coaches yeah. that came, to, was a tremendous experience. Chad, um, uh, since the first day um, you were clear with you, your goals, I remember. Uh, uh, let me ask you, how uh, Great Bay's helped you to uh, become a college uh, coach? Yeah, it really helped me um, because I, I, I could just I could see everything. Uh, differently, I, I think once you once you learn the great base and and, and the information from Rick Braden, and then the way that information uh, was put together by by Steve and all the other coaches, um, you just you, you can't unsee things. I think you just uh, can can see technique um, and understand how it works and really really be able to break down any any stroke, a forehand, the backhand, a serve, um, where before I could be on the court and I, I, I kind of I kind of thought I know what was going on, but I, you know, the, I remember with the test, with the USPTA test, uh, 
before he had to do a stroke analysis and kind of figure out what the major flaw was and then secondary problem. And I remember that always being for a PTM student, that was like the hardest part of the test was identifying what the major flaw was and all the secondary. So after going through the Great Base, I mean, those major flaws, I mean, it was so, they were so easy to identify because you, you understood uh, right down from the ready position to the very next, you know, the unit turn and going through all the checkpoints. I mean, you just understood exactly uh, how you wanted someone to, to hit the ball. And in turn, now as a college coach, you can watch other people um, you know, hit, hit 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 a ball and know exactly. Okay, hey, here's how we can take advantage of somebody else's strokes and 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 and, and how someone's technique is going to uh, affect their tactics and what they're going to be able to do. So, um, yeah, you kind of I don't know. I think sometimes my players look at me like I'm a a mad scientist with the things that I tell them, um, but for me, it's just. Uh, how do you guys not see this? You know, like uh, what, 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 once you see a, a, a palm up serve, um, you, you can't ever unsee it. So I think just learning, learning information that I didn't get before, um, and then having it be so simplified, but then having um, science and physics and everything else to back it up, uh, it, it gave me a lot of confidence to go on the court, whether it be with a uh, a, a three or four year old teaching them for the first time or being on the court with somebody that's, you know, top 200 in the world. Um, you kind of learn that tennis is tennis and technique is technique. So getting that information, which a lot of people don't have, especially I feel like a lot of college coaches, I think they, they, they maybe think they know a lot about technique, but uh, mm. they, they couldn't go on a court with a beginning player and, within one hour make them dramatically better um, just by showing them how to hit the ball better. So getting that knowledge for me was was invaluable. I have a very smart coach today. I talked to him on the phone and we're talking about college coaches teaching beginners. I said, well, they don't teach beginners. He said, no, Steve, yeah. they, they can't teach beginners. They can. So they don't and they can't. Um, that's not beating up college coaches. Um, I told so many college coaches that I trained Never grow away from teaching beginners. Never grow away from teaching basics. And then in some sports, you think of someone standing, I know you're a big basketball fan, um, football, other sports, but, you know, Michael Jordan stand at the foul line. You know, they just honor the fundamentals of making that shot from, what, 15 feet out. Yeah. And, and uh, Chad, uh, uh, learning from great base and uh, years uh, with experience, uh, tell us uh, what is a good practice for you uh, that you leave uh, the, the courts uh, with your team and you say that this was a good practice. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think a, a great practice for for us is being able to really work on whatever the players need need to work on, and then have them have a very clear understanding of once we put something maybe into a a drill situation or a live ball situation and we can, you know, work on a tactic or work on a technique that they just walk away from the court and they, they, they better understand it. I think with, with coaching the, the college players, I think the, the, the hardest thing to get them to buy into is that they can make changes or make improvements. I think a lot of them just think like, oh, I'm already, 18 years old, 20 years old, 22 years old. Um, there's not really that much that I can, I can learn or maybe I, maybe coach, you can get me a little bit better, but this is kind of how I, I play. Um, so I, I, I still, so when we had senior day with our team and then I was kind of reflecting, um, with some of our seniors, they always talk about this time that their freshman year, um, you know, I, I, I was re- I was really getting frustrated in one of the practices on, on how they were playing doubles. Uh-huh. Um, serve and stay back. You know, no one's volleying, no one's crossing. Just, I mean, it was it was terrible. So, um, I had our assistant coach at the time, Nathan Huggett, who's who spent some time with you all as well in, in Memphis. I said, Nathan, we're gonna go get the camera. We're gonna film this, 
and we're going to save this for a rainy day. So we, 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 we filmed one of the matches. Uh, I think it was like a week later it rained. So we go, Hey guys, we're going to bring you in the, in the classroom and, and show you some doubles. And we were, we weren't even 90 seconds in, you know, I was kind of telling them where to stand and what the roles were on the court. And once I hit play and they were watching, like, Hey, this is what should happen. Here's what you're going to do. And, and I, always remember Steve doing this drill called dummy doubles uh, where pretty much no, nobody could get it right. Everyone was making a mistake and rotating people out. So I, I basically was doing dummy doubles with them. And the guys were, the guys were on the floor laughing that it was, it was so bad. Um, and we really got to do some video and they all at the end of this, whatever 45 minutes hour session, they all understood what the roles, responsibilities, whatever. So when we had the, the next practice, it was night and day better. Everyone knew how to stand. Everyone knew where they were trying to serve, how they were trying to move, how they were trying to get into the net, where the ball had to go. Um, so for me, just seeing our players really really learn something. I mean, are there times that we just need to hit cross courts and play some points? Yeah, but I think... Uh, when you can really have the players walk away from the court and say, "Well, coach, I didn't, I didn't know that," or you really helped me with this, this, this stroke, this technique, this tactic. I think those make you feel the best as a, a as a college coach, and then your players realizing that you actually have information to share with them um, always makes them keep coming back for more and asking more questions. And um, so, I think. For us, the easiest place to make a a big change for them and to have those good practices is really through doubles. I think a lot of juniors just don't get a lot of experience playing doubles, and then there's just so many techniques and tactics that you can teach them um, from there. Great. Uh, let, let me let, let me ask you. I think you uh, answered, but uh, um, uh, we saw you. Uh, 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 growing as a coach, we work together. In, in, uh, if we are, uh, Steve and I, we visit you and your campus and your uh, resort, you call resort. Um, and um, we uh, show up as uh, uh, unexpected. And what do you think we were impressed about you, uh, your team and uh, your practice? Uh, you, you pr you'd probably cry a little bit, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, but I. You know, I, I think the the things that I would want to teach them sometimes as a coach, um, sometimes I feel like it's a little bit more more difficult depending on what their their goals are. Um, but I, I, I would like to think these guys would, would show up and see uh, a, a great organization to the practice, um, you know, not where you're seeing uh, any – any palm up serves that's for sure um and then just just seeing uh you know doubles trying to be played the right way i mean we're we, we definitely make an emphasis on, on on trying to serve and go to the net I, I think that's been a harder harder sell now than 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 ever um definitely more more difficult than it was when i was coaching at hcc and that was the the mandatory thing that we did and we were very successful in that um but yeah i think you still come and and seeing learning taking place or people being able to work on specific things i mean I, I i don't shy away from um taking some kids out of a, a live ball practice and having them go uh drop hit balls or get hand fed by somebody else and and really work on really work on their technique. We've been able to to do that with some of our players and make some major major changes and try to do some pre and post video types of things with them. So I think we you, you definitely see more technique being done than you would see at most college practices or maybe all other college practices. But um, I think with those would probably be the main the main takeaways. So many things when you uh, just mentioned rainy day. Uh, in our world, we'll have an 11 year old come in and we'll could even say, Well, I think if you were to take a minimum of three months off from competitive play and live ball, 
Um, we have a young girl from Toronto who's doing better and better. She's 12, and she's we've known her, I think, 17 months, and um, she came once for four months, and now she's been back for seven months. In the first four months, uh, she didn't play. I mean, her game was a train wreck from every grip, of every grip. Like, okay, we got to go back to, to square one, and that's so difficult in, 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 in college tennis. Um, the dummy doubles, i uh, touch upon that. You know, especially if you're wearing a whistle, it helps out. But, uh, I mean, you can, you can have people go, like, you blow the whistle at least 15 times before they can play a point. And that, that comes from Dennis Vandermeer. Uh, Dennis used to do that, where, okay, let's play doubles. And, you know, you know both uh, a typical junior match or club match, both, both the uh, players in the forecourt are standing right smack in the middle of the box. And, you know, it just, you know it's obviously a little better in college tennis, but not much, where one player is hiding in the alley. And I know you spent a lot of time with my son, Connor, who had a lot of success in doubles. And people used to say to him, uh, you're a really good doubles player. And he goes, well, not really. I just know where to stand. <laughs> and I remember telling Connor, well, that's a great line. You could just add to it. Why don't you say, like, I know where to stand and how to hang on to the racket. You can see people in the ready position, if they have a full Western grip, you just know. Um, and the racket's angled, it's not centered. You just know that they're most likely not going to be an instinctive volleyer. I want to go back to a couple things. Um, you know, we talk about the brain typing. When we talk about everything that you did when you were with us. Um, but first impressions. So someone comes in, I mean, I think interviews are a two-way street. So you come in spring break and you meet us. Um, and I said, well, here's a list of a few people that you can call. Then also your very first week, um, it was a very unusual week. I remember it was uh, Gareth Ducre who was taught to play tennis by Dave Anderson. And he was spending a year with us. And um, it was just once a year, way back when, Jim Courier, Courier's kids. Jim Courier, number one tennis player in the world. Um, he's from the greater Tampa area, has, has a foundation. And I think it was um, six to eight ladies. And, yeah. and I had, and they, they came and took a, a week long camp. And we were basically just training tennis teachers and training juniors. Oh, we did a, we did a few uh, adult workouts and that, but um, I remember you. Uh, I said, "Here, just take your clipboard, and you can watch, and then you can just pick up balls and talk to the ladies a little bit during their water breaks." But uh, just watch this young eighteen-year-old teach this group, and you know, I would come by and say, "Okay, now do this, and now do this." And um, but I, I remember giving you a list. Uh, Craig Tiley was on the list, and at the time, he was up and coming, just not, you know. Highly regarded. I have to think about the years where he won a national championship. I think it was 2003. Um, and I remember you saying, you know Craig Tiley? Who, who else was on that short list? Do you remember anybody else besides Tiley? Yeah, the, the, the two people you, you really pushed for me to, to call were um, Matt Davis um, okay. and, and Craig, Craig Tiley. So, um you know, Matt obviously had a had a connection with with Sarah State, and I remember you you made the connection for me that Matt was also the the student body, the PTM Student Association president. Um, and and Matt, I, I had I had known I had met him before. I knew he was a uh, um, a big Sarah State guy, PTM guy. He'd always circle back to all the annual banquets. But you know, in talking with with Matt, he was. You know, he's like, yeah, you, 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 you have to go work for, you have to go work for Steve. I mean, you're going to learn more, um, you know, in one month with Steve than you learned four years in the Ferris State program. So that made a big impression. And then um, in, in talking with, with Craig Tiley, I mean, he, he just seemed like he was a, a, a famous name in, in college tennis because what he had done with uh, – the Illinois program and basically going from uh, the, the worst team in the Big Ten to the best team in the Big Ten and then the best team in the country. So being from Michigan I, I, and being a huge Michigan fan, I, I was a big ten, definitely a Big Ten supporter. So to be able to talk to Craig was was, was great. But just to hear him say, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to go work for Steve, um, you're going to learn the, the, the nuts and bolts of, teaching tennis and that's going to be able to 
translate into being a college coach. And you know, that's how I basically designed my teams at Illinois was through the information I got there. So really after talking with those two guys, that, that pretty much sealed the deal for me to, to really be excited and want to come down and learn. Yeah, I forgot it was Matt. Matt, when, Matt did an internship with me, and then he went to Ferris State, and he actually played on the team. Um, you know, he's had a lot to do with the USPTA over the years. He's a tennis professional based in, in Chicago. Um, with, um, yeah, the brain typing, um, you, you, you uh, tested as an ENTP. Um, a lot of ENTPs, you know, you can be an extroverted, extroverted, introvert, introverted, extrovert. Um, but on the college campuses where the Myers Briggs is you know, still used to this day for college placement, the descriptor is you're a planner. And then selfishly, I mean, altruistically, is okay, this young man wants to be a college coach, we'll, we'll help him become a college coach. Um, but we hired you, I hired you with the idea that um, you would um, help us with what we're still trying to do to this day. But when you were with us, besides working the tennis school, we had a house where we housed players. Um, sleep 16 players, it was 6,000 square feet, two places side by side, two townhouses, um, girls' house, boys' house. You went to grad school then on, the t on top of that at one point of your five years, I think it was maybe two of the last five where you managed the facility. I don't know if it was quite, yeah. quite two years, but uh, those were some long days. Um, you paid your dues. Make an understatement. Yeah, I was a, I was a glutton for punishment back then, <laughs> back then for sure. There was some some long days, but for, I mean, for me, I never to be honest, I never felt like uh, maybe aside from doing the master's degree, but it never really felt like a a long day. It was. Uh, there were so many people that came through. There was just, I just felt like every week I was learning more and more and more. And I remember you told me, uh, you know, when you were meeting with somebody or just, you know, just, just, just try to be in the room and learn as much as you can. And I remember watching, uh, even Roberto at the, at the tennis complex on, on lunch breaks. I mean, he was, putting in a slow motion analysis tapes and stringing rackets or having his lunch and, uh, you know, just watching those tapes. So yeah, just, there was, there was always something to, to learn or someone to talk to or a story to hear. And for me, I just tried to, to, to eat that up. Um, you know, then, then when I finally looked at the clock and it was whatever, two or 3 AM and we we're going to wake up at, at six o'clock. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't as fun then, but, uh, you know, it, it was just tremendous to learn from all the people that came through. And then, uh, I mean, when I was learning the system, when I first came, it was just, it was, it was, there was just so much, and they had so many questions and different ways to look at things, but really being able to watch those, those videos that you were, that you were making for all the students when they came in, that was, that was tremendous. I just tried to, to, to learn and kind of regurgitate everything I learned through watching those videotapes. Now, just to hear you say that uh, brings back a memory where with Roberto, um, I think with our listeners, if people could string rackets and watch those videos at the same time over and over and over again, you know, it's really disheartening that we'll make a film, somebody will fly in from out of country even, we make a slow motion analysis, um, we're around 15% of the people send us notes, we say watch it three times, send us notes. Um, yeah, but yeah, it was a long, long time ago. I remember my former wife, uh, the, the coach before you, your predecessor, he, um, you know, things just weren't working out and he, he resigned. Um, and I think it was, he was going to be, you know, he was a, a day short of being told he had to resign. But um, with that, um, I remember my former wife told you to put your glasses on. So when you, we just went to meet with the AD and a lot of times at a junior college, the AD doesn't have an extensive sports background. I think in most major campuses, uh, an AD, yeah, the first, first guess is they have a football, back, football background. Second guess is they have a basketball background. But with, um, tell me the, tell us, I should say, the meeting with the UConn 
basketball coach with I I remember Bobby Knight when the uh, NCAs were in town and there's just you know a lot of famous basketball coaches would come and use our gym and practice there um tell us about do you, you have any recollection for that UConn practice I don't know if I was there when UConn was there um maybe it was somebody else but uh, I remember the, what's the name of the basketball coach uh, Gino G- Riyama. what is it Gino Oriyama. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy to read about. So I thought it was you, or uh, you know, we would anytime there was top coaches to go listen to. Uh, even when the you know the Tampa Bay box, um, there might be some public setting where um, you'd help me out, Tony, with a, with the box. He was a coach for a long time. Oh, Tony. Dun- yeah, we, we're breaking up a little bit, Tony. Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy. But yeah, so it was a UConn, I thought it was you, the UConn basketball coach, he introduced his staff and he said, this is my assistant so-and-so and she's in charge of offense. This is my assistant and she's in charge of defense. And this is my assistant and he's in charge of going to get me a Pepsi right now. <laughs> but I thought that was you. But uh, No, I think you got to just open yourself for, for learning. Um, and, and along those lines, um, how about yourself being, you know, you went to, you worked at UCF and then, then went back to your alma mater. Uh, and now you're at St. Leo. Um, I talked to you not too long ago. You said you were helping out uh, with a timer, the clock at a basketball game. Have you, have you and have your players learned a lot by being around other athletes? Yeah. I mean, for me, for sure. Like I said, I've always connected with basketball players and our, um, our basketball coach, uh, Lance Randall, he he and his family uh, play tennis, and um, his son has played a couple of the UTR tournaments that we have. So, um, so it was e- easy connection for both of us. But yeah, I, I still work the uh, the game clock scoreboard for the St. Leo basketball games as, as much as I can. Um, but yeah, it's just, I mean it's it's great for our, for our athletes to be around others. I mean, I, I think a couple of times that we've, you know, that we've gone into the, gone into the basketball gym and maybe they, you know, the athletes here, another coach kind of yelling at their athletes to try to get them to something. They, they kind of look over at me like, Oh, maybe, maybe coach, you're, you're not so bad. Or, you know, I, there's days on the, our, our, our tennis courts are, kind of sandwiched in between um they're right behind our baseball our baseball field we have a, a practice soccer field uh right right across the sidewalk and then we also have uh, beach volleyball courts right there so they get a chance to be around other athletes every every day or hear other coaches coaching their team so it it's great i mean we uh, and our athletes have actually been very good about going to, to support other other athletes and their sporting events and be around it. And I think a lot of our tennis players have kind of taken a liking to basketball just because they hear me talk about it or some of them follow maybe NBA teams or whatever. And they, they start to go to those games. But, uh, but yeah, I think you just learn so much from um, other coaches, especially I, I always try to read books or listen to, to different talks. Um, there, there's one website I like to listen to a lot. Uh, it's called What Drives Winning. And they go through a lot of different coaches and kind of their approach to what it's like to be a coach or how they get their athletes to do certain things. And uh, I think you just learn so much from coaches from other sports and then can find a way to plug that in of how it works with, with a specific tennis team. Because especially in college tennis, it's such a it's such a unique thing where you have an individual sport that collides with a team sport. And a lot of those, uh, you know, there's a lot of players on our team that maybe grew up playing, playing soccer. So they understand the, the team part of it. And then other players on our team have never really been on a, on a, in a team sport before. So I, I think you, you learn so much or like I learned so much from basketball and how to, take a team sport and how to combine it with an individual sport and have everyone kind of understand their role. I think that's been, been great for our team. Um, uh, Chad, uh, uh, let me ask you, um, 
with your experience now, years uh, coaching, what will, will tell you to the young coaches they, they want to start in a, as a career? Uh, what will you tell you uh, then? Starting as a, yeah, if they're starting a career as a as a college coach. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I would tell someone is just never never stop learning. Um, like for me, I had to take a completely different approach um, than most because you know, as you've heard on this podcast, I I was not a I was not an accomplished tennis player unless you're counting my MVP from the JV tennis team. Uh, which I, I do not count. Um, so I, I really had to take an approach of, um, you know, not someone that can say, you know, hey, I, I, I made it to the quarterfinals of Wimbledon or I was an All-American at this college and, and, and this was my ranking, things like that. I really had to take an approach, still take an approach with my team of, um, you know, just, just, just how to do things better, how to, how to learn how to learn discipline, how to hit a ball better, how to do tactics better. So I think for someone getting into the industry, if you, if you were, you were or are a player, don't just rely on that as your background, really, really try to learn information that's going to help um, your athletes get better. And if you are someone that's not a, a not a very accomplished tennis player, um, even more so, you need to learn the information and get your players to to trust you because you can help them get better. So I think just trying to learn with the times, or you hear a lot of coaches say now, like, you know, the athletes now compared to 10 years ago or night and day different, I, I couldn't agree with that more. But I think you, you have to you have to change with the times too. Um, and, and, like, for tennis, the information – uh, really stays the same. I think everyone likes to talk about the modern game and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Well, I think that's where the great base is, is great. If you don't have a, if you don't have, if you don't have a base of information, I think it's really hard to understand how to, how to teach someone out, teach somebody to hit the ball better or what good tactics are, or, or things like that. But I think if people can continue to, to learn, to read, to, to watch videos, talk to other coaches, um, I think that's the way to go. Like I said, my, my experience with, with you all with Tennis Smith and, and all the coaches I got a chance to meet there and also even at, within Hillsborough Community College and the different sports that were there, I, I learned so much just from talking to other people and, and how they did things and how they work with athletes. But if you're going to get into tennis, I mean, you gotta you got to learn the nuts and bolts. I, I think that's what helped. Uh, propel my career is just feeling comfortable knowing that I the, the, knowing that I, I know what I'm talking about not just yeah. throwing out information or just uh, hoping that I can give a, a little bit uh, one tip or talk to a kid on the changeover and that's going to make the difference I mean um, pe people people figure that out really quick so if you can really keep learning I think that's, that's, that's the key for our listeners, uh, nuts and bolts, you can't build anything without nuts and bolts. So that means technique and then also X's and O's. Um, it's amazing how um, a lot of people don't really know the X's and O's of, you know, where you, the position of the singles player, the position of the doubles players. Um, one thing with Chad, for our listeners, we had this tiebreaker test where you have to hit six shots to designate targets. So Chad comes in and obviously he hasn't played a lot of tennis. He's not a tennis player per se. And I remember just telling Chad, I said, you've got to learn to hit the ball really well. You've got to be able to demonstrate. You've got to be able to hit the ball on a dime. So um, there's so many things we can talk about. Uh, you know, I think one thing that certainly helped you out is you won a national championship when you were working with us, coaching the junior college girls. We didn't have a, a junior college boys team, just the, the women, not the men. But we have, I just say, Chad, uh, just, just have, just go through the tiebreaker test and you'll be able to beat every girl in the tiebreaker test. Because, That's right. Because they just couldn't hit the target and uh, do that periodically. I can remember one time I televised, um, it was a televised match, and for one reason or the other, they had the pros trying to hit targets, and the pros couldn't hit targets. And Dick Braden called himself Fat Albert. He comes out on the court and he could hit the target. You know, just, uh, you know, no running involved. 
just feed me the ball and you want me to hit, you know, to this cross court target. Um, I love sharing the Dennis Vandermeer drill where you get a, you get a feeder, you get a hitter and you get a, a spotter and the, 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 hit, the hitter hits 10 balls and they're say hitting the down the line forehand, up the line forehand. And, um, you just mark where each shot lands and they're not, not, they can't find the target. It's amazing. But I think one thing too, uh, glutton for punishment, all the work, um, our listeners should know you coach two teams. You coach men and women, and you only have two grad assistants. Uh, tell us a little bit about that workload. That's right. Um, no, it's uh, I've done I've done two teams now for the last I guess eleven years. I, I first started doing that um, at Ferris State. Before that, I did just the women's team at at HCC, and then I did just the men's team at UCF. So. Um, I got, I got off to an easy, easier start when I first started doing both programs because at, at Ferris State, um, the women's, uh, conference season was in the fall and the men's conference season was in the spring. So I was really able to kind of focus more on the women's program in the fall, even though the guys did have a couple of tournaments that uh, made it much easier. And then in the spring, I kind of flip flopped. The women had some matches, but not as many. And a lot of times the, the, the teams would travel to the, the same place and play. So, um, and, and the rules with the NCAA in, in terms of practicing, um, when they both were out of season, uh, they had a lot less time on the court. So it made it much easier uh, for running practices. Now at St. Leo, with having both teams having a uh, uh, a, non- a non-championship fall and kind of a championship spring segment. Um, yeah, it's very it's very challenging uh, to do both teams. I've, I've kind of done it a variety of ways. When I when I first came in to be the coach, um, we we completely separated the, the practices. So the the men would practice out a a two hour or two and a half hour block, completely different than. The women's team, uh, they might have overlapped by, you know, 30 minutes, but we ran two practices a day. And then I, by, I think it was my third year, um, my wife and I were expecting our first child. So I was really nervous on, on how that was going to go and wanted to be home when I could and make sure my wife was handling everything as well. So then we started doing uh, both teams with practice at the same time. So it kind of reduced the, the workload for me. Um, and I thought the quality still stayed really good with both teams doing at the same time. And then now we kind of do a combination of both, um, really depending on their class schedules. I, I know for this next fall, we're going to go back to completely split. Um, but there'll be times in the spring we'll probably uh, overlap or practice at the same time just because of class schedule conflicts. But yeah, doing two teams is certainly a challenge when it comes to uh, practice planning, uh, matches, things like that. So we do try to have our team go to the same locations where we can, um, or we just completely split up the matches where I'll travel with one team and the other team will stay home and, and practice with our with our assistant coach. Um, but, yeah, it's also having, as you mentioned, uh, a graduate assistant for the men and a graduate assistant for the women. It's definitely a challenge when you're, you're rotating people every two years. Um, I, I feel like uh, right about the time that they really get a good grasp of how everything works and the system that I like to do, um, the relationships they build with the players, things like that, that takes usually about a year and a half for them to really understand what we're trying to do. Um, so they really only have about one semester where they're really able to, to fully help me and the team and our athletes. Um, but it's still great to have help on each, on each side, but, uh, yeah, doing two teams is, is, is certainly difficult. It's just double the work with everything in terms of, uh, recruiting, budgeting, paperwork, compliance, uh, things like that. You're just doing, doing everything twice. But for clarity, you have no assistant coach, your your ADs, um, or your student assistants. I'm sorry, are um, they're your assistant coaches? 
Yeah, there are there are assistant coaches. That's right. And do you overlap, or I mean, do you have one coming, one going, or do you have two new ones every two years? So we did. Um, well, kind kind of thanks to the pandemic, we we before we had two people coming in and leaving at the same time. Then through the through the pandemic, um, we were able to hire our women graduate assistant and then we had a, a a male hired as well and then kind of last second he decided to to take another position at a division one school and then when we listed the position again our university went on a on a hiring freeze um you know through the pandemic just to just to kind of watch our our, our budgeting so uh last not this past season, but the season before with COVID, it was just uh, myself and our our women's graduate assistant. And then we hired a new male graduate assistant this year. So right now we're on a kind of a staggered basis where I have one, one staying and one on the way out, which is, which is much better. But yeah, for, for two, two cycles of, of graduate assistants, I had them starting and ending at the same time, so that was pretty difficult. I think for our listeners, uh, um, I heard a gentleman say this one time: it's so important um, when someone asks you, "How did you get your master's?" and that you you don't want to answer, "Mom and Dad paid for it." Um, so that's another um, role that's uh, quite taxing, where a lot of times. Uh, Someone, they get their tuition paid for. They uh, may, you could tell us a little about your situation where they they live at the student assistant. They live in the dorm, get to eat in the cafeteria for free. And, but then they have to work, work, work. Um, You know, I ran uh, tennis tech. I never had a full-time employee. Uh, Ran it all really with lab assistants. Uh, that were so dedicated, they're paid six hundred dollars a month. Um, but how about your um, student assistant? Someone like Nathan came to work for you. So did he get to live in the dorm as like a, as so that, a, as an RA? Yeah. So that's kind of a maybe our major negative is we we we, we pay for their tuition um, and then they get a it's a ten month contract. It's a ten thousand dollars stipend, so a thousand dollars per month. Um, but they're on their own for meals and on their own for for housing, um, which made it made it even more of a challenge now because our area is really uh, it's really growing quickly. The housing market's much tougher in this area than it was a few years ago. Um, so I know our university has been talking about trying to secure a house or an apartment or something that we could keep rotating GAs through. But currently, they're they're completely on their own. So yeah, they're uh, they got to be really dedicated to to, to do it. Cause it's, a, it's a lot of hours, not a lot of pay, and um, you know they've got to be willing to, to do some some things outside of the their GA uh, responsibilities in terms of teaching lessons or um, you know with a ten month contract. A lot of times they're going in the summer and trying to find a summer camp or a club or something like that to work at. Um, and, and make some funds so they can help pay for their apartment and food once they come back uh, for the academic year. At all these terms, I wasn't using the term GA, grad, grad assistant, but RA, residential assistant. Um, I don't know, but years ago, um, it was a pretty safe bet that each dorm had an apartment on the floor for a resident assistant. I don't think that's the case anymore. Chad, talk about tennis camps. You're a tennis camp junkie. Um, you worked at a lot of different tennis camps. Yeah, I've, I've definitely done my fair share of, of tennis camps. Um, I really started out through a, through two summers I did uh, through the, the PTM internships. I did uh, two summers at the Michigan State uh, Nike tennis camps with uh, Tim Bauer and now the recently re- retired Gene Orlando. Um, and then I've done camps, obviously, at the Tennis Smith School through the summers there. Uh, was the director of the the tennis academy at Harvard camps, and then um, now I'm doing uh, I'm the director of the Rollins Nike tennis camps 
uh, with Andy Gladstone. So, yeah, I just really uh, I got labeled there for a little bit. I think as the as the camp guy, especially through uh, doing the the camps at Harvard. I mean, those were ten weeks of camp. Um, we pretty much were doing training every morning before we got started. And then there in the, in the Boston area, we were getting probably averaging over 200, uh, campers per, per week. Um, and we had campers as young as three and as old as 18. And, um, so that definitely presented some challenge with the different age groups. But again, the, 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 the camps at Harvard were, were a lot of fun because we really went to, we went there to, to, to implement the, the great base and the system of instruction. So those kids were, 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 were full blown, um, learning how to hit the ball better and, um, still having fun and doing camp games. But it was really fun to see how much those campers improved at the end of the week. I think even their, their parents were always shocked of they'd come in having no clue of how to hit the tennis ball. And at the end of the week, they actually looked like they were a pretty accomplished player. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And obviously during summer tennis camps, typically you're not seeing a lot of instruction. It's just more of a, the experience and being around other campers and playing and doing games and, and having fun. But, that's where the, the the Harvard camps were were really fun to see the the players getting better and unfortunately I don't think any of them really stuck with with tennis too much after they did their their couple of weeks of camp um, but uh, those kids were definitely hitting the ball a lot better. Well, a few things on the Harvard tennis camp. Uh, I remember Roberta's daughter Jackie going with me and with Bonnie Dave Fish's wife. Or we had to do the paperwork so uh, she could go and, you know, okay, I, I would be the legal guardian. And obviously, you have to tell us how old Jackie was when you came to uh, what we called Tennis Smith School at the time. But so many stories with Harvard Tennis Camp. But the problem with that in general is like, we have people fly in and put them through an assessment. But many times they go home and there's no one to help them. There's no one right. in, in their area. And we're talking about like a major city. Uh, although, maybe I should backtrack, maybe not a major city. We, we do have um, people that we've trained here, there, and everywhere. But um, yeah, that was a fun experience. So the, for 12 years um, at Harvard, they used the pathway curriculum we put together. Um, but Roberto, we go to the library and look at the, the manual. There's, you know, it, it, it's uh, Roberto's young daughter who, uh, um, graduated. She played at Amherst, and um, but, you know, teaching the three H system of balance. And Cheyenne Hawk was the he um, he has two degrees from Tufts. Really bright guy from Bangladesh, and he came down for a weekend. Um, it's just funny how things work out. So Gordon Graham was the women's coach, and you, you would have been there, I'm sure. So he comes in and he's recruiting Liberty Specky, who went to Vanderbilt. So there's four or five of us coaching. We just sit on the bleachers or over on those picnic tables in the shade, and and uh, we're just you know visiting with Gordon, and I'm just blowing my whistle every once in a while, and the practice is just run by players, you know. So we the coaches, we're not tied to a ball basket. We don't have to just keep pumping up balls. The the, the practice will run with just a few uh, directives from us. So Gordon, very quiet guy. He went back and he talked to Dave. That, you know, they should have me come up to be a speaker. And they were having, you know, some well-known person come in to run their orientation. And um, I said, you know, the, so Dave actually came. This is back, you'd laugh, uh, Roberto would laugh. This is back at the point where I didn't want to have a cell phone. And I'd have to borrow one of my son's cell phones. If I had, I had to, you know, someone had to get a hold of me. So Dave Fish, the Harvard team was down playing USF and, um, Someone I know you uh, got to know really well, Jeremy Wurzman. So uh, Dave Fish is basically interviewing me, and, and I'm not really giving him any answers. I said, well, you know, those workshops, I mean, it's like putting sugar on sugar cereal. I mean, I've done them forever. I go up there for two days, and it's a Vic Braden thing. I'll share 50 points with 50 people. It'll be 
interpret it 50 different ways, do the math. And I said, what you really need to do is send your camp director down here. And that was Cheyenne. And you know, he, he called up Dave and he said, uh, it's not going to take two days. It's going to take at least two months. And he didn't quite come back for two months. He came back um, almost a, a month in length. And, and that's where it began. And then I, I went for the first five years. I got to the point where um, I didn't go during orientation. But that makes me think of, um, you know, we're trying to do so many things to help you with uh, building a resume because of the BS of tennis, if, you know, the top jobs go to former players. So Roberto, a soccer player, myself, a hockey player, getting into the sport late, you know, we were in the same position you were in. But I can remember we made a presentation, you and I applied, and um, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, we made a presentation on your camp and team um, should be run the same. And what we did, and again, that's back in the day, is that Tylee's team was one of the top teams, and it was an amazing story in tennis because, you know, Illinois at that time, you know, USC, UCLA, Stanford, maybe once in a while Texas, well, a school not, not a Southern California, or not a, not a California school, Georgia, Florida, but um, Illinois was not going to, no one was going to bet on Illinois to win or even be competitive at the NCA. So, um, yeah, so obviously you worked and worked our library, but we dug and dug. And uh, at one point, um, Tylee went to Japan. I have all this on film. I had gone to Japan, and then they asked me um, a year or so afterwards, they said, Do you have anybody you recommend? And Tylee at that point had good ink. You know, he was building his. Um, uh, notoriety, I mean, that, okay, credibility, if you would. So anyway, um, you and I, you know, I started the presentation, but it was for you to be the presenter. But we had the, we have it on film to this day, a uh, film that Tylee showed in Japan of the Illinois players, like Amir Delic, who's a great player. And I mean, I think he uh, was top 60, top 50 player in the world and NCAA champion. We had pictures of them shadow swinging in front of a mirror. We had film of them shadow swinging in front of the mirror and, and drop hitting balls. Um, and you know, anyway, that's, that's one thought but with tennis camps. But one thing is Ed Kraft. Tell the listeners a little bit about working for Eddie Baby. Um, you know, he's been a guest we've had on our podcast and how those ID camps work. Yeah, so uh, Ed does the college tennis exposure camps, and he, he only hires uh, – Head, co head collegiate coaches to work with the camps. He's he's got camps in the Northeast. Um, really, the first experience I I had, I had met Ed. Really, he was a, Ed was a good friend of uh, Tom Douglas, who was the PTM director. So Ed Ed I met for the first time um, at Ferris State. He was a presenter and like wow, this guy knows knows everybody in, in college tennis. And Tom was like, yeah, you, you gotta you gotta know Ed. Um, so as, as before it invited me, I invited me out a couple of times just to recruit at the camps. Um, I always told him like, Hey, I'm, I'm available to coach you if you ever need someone extra. And I think a couple of years ago was the first time that Ed invited me to, to be one of the coaches. And now I've been doing his camps ever since, but, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great opportunity for, for players to go there and just be around, uh, college style practices and um, Ed's very big on teaching teaching directionals to the players and um, Ed's obviously uh, well known for his one on one doubles and he's getting getting players to to come to the net and you know, they can win points at the at the net they get a get a bonus point and things like that so I think Ed's been Ed's been great for for college tennis and tennis in general because he's really been promoting uh, kids serving and balling and trying to come to the net and Ed, Ed was even gracious enough when I was uh, coaching at, at Hillsborough Community College where he was so impressed that we were getting our, our women to, to serve and volley first and second serve uh, he wrote an article about it in, in Florida Tennis Magazine and 
but yeah, Ed's a great guy. He's got ton, tons of energy. Uh, he gets the kids really excited. He gets their parents really excited about college tennis and and playing an all around type of type of game. So for me, it's been great to be around around him, other college coaches, and just helping junior tennis players kind of navigate through the the NCAA in the recruiting process to playing college tennis. With the parents, um, what do you think of the service for these companies that charge a fee and help help find a scholarship? It's definitely got its positives and negatives. I think um, you know. I think a lot of parents just always make the comment that just, they just have no idea how it works. So um, I, I think having someone help them. Uh, with maybe registering with the MCAA Eligibility Center and how all that works is is really helpful. Um, I definitely think for the international students out there, it's, it, it, it's super helpful for them to have uh, the, those recruiting services because they really don't know the difference between one school and the next school. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the work really can be can be done by 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 the player. Um, they kind of know what area they want to go to, and uh, I think UTRs really help people understand the different levels that each each team has with the uh, with the rankings, and then the power power team rankings in UTR. Um, but uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think they're beneficial if you have the, the, the luxury to, to be able to afford going through one of them, and um, I, I think they're definitely helpful. I think the frustration that I've always had with those companies um, is that they just really push uh, Division One tennis. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people really know the, the, the differences in the levels between Division One and Division Two, and you know the, the the players that can play at a a top Division One school or a, or in a Power Five conference. Typically, those players don't need a a recruiting company that the coaches are, are seeking them out. Um, but I definitely think it's beneficial for those that, you know, just need an extra push or extra look or um, kind of somebody helping to get a, get a coach to look at them, look at them twice. What about uh, with Ed? He's got a great concept. Uh, we used to call it ghost doubles. I remember watching Bob Hewitt and Fru McMillan play that for the first time. You just, you know, say if you're a deuce court player, you just specialize in the deuce court. You don't have to do that, but that's typically back in the day, uh, even to this day to a certain extent, where the, the deuce court player just plays a set in the deuce court and the partner plays in the ad court and they play against one another. Um, I remember we made it mandatory. You had to have a palm down serve and you had a certain volley. Even if we were to lose six love, six love, and you, you can make some comments on that where your team won the national title. Um, but I share this quite often. You said so many things. Um, well, um, the one, the one up, one back doubles. That you, you know, you stayed in touch with the girls who played for you, and then many of them went on and played for the third and fourth year. For the people listening from overseas, a junior college is your first and second year. We call freshman, sophomore, and then when you move on, um, you're going to play your third and fourth year junior and senior year, but all the, all the girls you worked with when they, after two years with you, they had to go back to one up, one back. Oh, comment on that if you would. They, yeah, they did. I, I, it was always funny to get that call from them and it really just drove them crazy. They just, you know, coach, I don't know any other way to play than serve and go in. And I, now I'm just having to almost uh, think too much on the court. I have to, you know, nowhere. I, I know I need to play the ball cross court, but it's so much more pressure for me uh, to serve and stay back and continuously pound the ball cross court and try to get it away from the person at the net. So, yeah, they, they, you know, they, they probably didn't like it for the first, or I know they didn't like it for the first semester that we were doing it because they just, I mean, they they weren't really sure where to serve. Obviously, their volleys weren't very good, especially. Um, hitting half volleys or low volleys, but they became very, very good at it. Uh, and we got to the point, I think we really were able to dominate some other teams because our, our girls were all over the net and we, we taught them how to 
move back and jump up and hit scissor kick overheads and, and be really athletic at the net. So, yeah, those other schools, they really they really struggled or got in arguments with their coach because they they wanted to still serve and, and go to the net, and their coaches would plot out tell them, like, no, we're not serving and coming in, not even, not even one time, uh, which was sad for those players because a lot of them um, became very, 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 very good at it. Um, and be able to kind of take over a doubles court. So, yeah, that was a big frustration they had when they were moving on to other schools, for sure. Well, it's certainly fun, too, to serve volley. Um, it, it's something that you can add to your tennis, your singles game. With Louis Kaye, oh, yeah. Louis Kaye he's looked upon as, um, you know, maybe rightfully so, he's working with the LTA, the French-Canadian, who indirectly have had a lot to do with Louis because they've trained many Canadian coaches and trained many Canadian juniors. Uh, this goes way back in the 80s. But, you know, he's definitely uh, working off stats, not just stats on, you know, service percentage and, and net appearances and such, but how many people are serving volume now. And it's, um, according to his stats, and this may not be current, but it's uh, getting close to 50-50 uh, on the men's tour. Or fifty percent of the players will serve and stay back. Now, granted, you can go on offense if you're, you know, that second ball you can play off the bounce. Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time when you teach them serve volley, sometimes you're actually going to split step and take a couple steps back and play it off the ground. It's not, you know, granted if in a drill situation where we play one bounce doubles, the ball can only bounce on the return. But um, yeah, and with that, I don't really understand the the, the um, these clinics on how to teach a woman. I mean, the difference between teaching a man and a woman. I mean, the ball doesn't know it's being hit by a, a male or female. I think yourself as a college coach dealing with both, you certainly could comment on that there are so many differences between coaching men and women, but not when it comes to ball striking. Aside from one up, one back, what would your comments be on uh, the differences between teaching men and women or coaching men and women? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of really tennis, I mean, tennis, Tennis is tennis. Um, tactics are tactics. So I don't think there's huge differences there. I think a lot of coaches, when they talk about the difference, they just talk about the the, the approach. You know, I, I feel like with our with our men's team, it's a lot more uh, breaking down their ego to try to get them to understand what we want them to do, um, and then 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 they'll listen as long as they know that the coach is gonna take charge and but also have a, a good relationship with them hear what they have to say but okay I, I'm the boss I'm making the call um, they're usually good with that we're coaching the women uh, I feel like it's a little bit you definitely want to focus more on the relationship I think I, I take more of a cooperative style of, of coaching when doing the with the women's tennis um, you know definitely not as much in, in, in your face coaching. Uh, with them, um, but in terms of tennis, I mean, it's not like I've got um, tactics or you know different strategies or techniques that I only do with the guys or only do with the girls. I think you're finding now on the women's side a lot of a lot, a lot of female players are hitting the the ball just as hard as as, as male players, and I think if anything, I, I have a little bit more fun coaching our women's team because we really try to teach them to be more all court and play all three zones. Uh, we work a lot on transition. We work a lot on them taking the ball out of the air, whether it be a conventional volley or a swinging volley, um, having them slice, having them drop shot, not really playing a typical just from the baseline hitting ground stroke type game. So I think why I say it's more fun is just I don't think they have a lot of experience doing that before they come and, and, and train with us, uh, certainly on the double side where the guys, they, they do that a little bit more and uh, typically they're a little bit more offensive with their shots where they can occasionally sneak in and, and poke a volley away. But I think that's probably the, the two things that we focus on a lot with both teams is just, trying to play the mid-court area and then being able to play uh, from the net or as we do with the seven singles concept, play that yellow zone and try to finish in the green zone. Um, we, work on, we work on that every single day in our practices. 
um, uh, Chad, uh, trying to help players and, uh, and general listeners, uh, uh, when you are recruiting and, and um, what are the, what are you looking in uh, players, uh, you as a coach and, and most of the coaches, uh, what, what are the things you, you're looking in uh, players to be part of your team? Yeah, so really the, the, there's, there's two things that I focus on the most right now with recruiting. One is um, just how passionate they are about tennis. Or I'm a, I'm a big uh, Detroit Lions fan. We have a new coach called Dan Campbell, and he just he, I heard him say, I just like football players that like ball, and they just like to play ball. So I've, I've tried to find tennis players that are the same way. They just love to... They love to train. They like ball. They, they, it's just what they're, just what they do. You know, it's, you don't have to, if it's, if the team's going to take Sunday off, mm -hmm. you know, that, that player is probably going to still go to the courts and hit some serves or, um, do a workout, go for a run, do something. And then the other main thing that I focus on is just trying to find ultra competitive, uh, tennis players. I, I think everyone will say, Oh, I, I'm competitive, but, um, you, you can tell the difference between people that are competitive and people who are competitive. Um, so we've been able to find people on our team that just, I mean, they're going to fight to the death um, on the court. They hate losing. Um, they're really, really competitive in everything that they do. Even outside the court, they're competitive with their grades. They're competitive with their fitness, with their diet. Um, so those are the, the two biggest qualities. In terms of qualities for a player, uh, for me, I, I prefer to try to find someone that's already pretty offensive with their game. I feel like it's a lot easier to teach them to, to play defense when they need to or work on their defense um, rather than having a defensive player and then try to teach them to be offensive. So our go-to with recruiting is trying to find people that are already trying to play offensive um, but that's not to say that we don't have defensive type players on our team, uh, because we definitely do. Um, and then for us, I mean, we're, we're going to look on, on how you're doing academically too. I mean, if you can't, if yeah. you can't do the work academically, um, and you can't stay on the court because of your grades then that's not going to help the team either. I mean, we kind of made our motto with our teams is we want them to be, champions both on the court and off the court and part of being champions off the court is trying to have the highest team gpa at st leo um so w again i think we just try to promote them being competitive in everything that they do and trying to recruit people that we can tell that they they, they love tennis they want to get better and they're going to be competitive to help our team win great great i think it's, it's going to help a lot and let, let me tell you, you have any stories that can help players uh, uh, suppose happen, happens in any teams that you said, uh, I think this player is going to help me. It's, it's going to make an impact and didn't, didn't happen. And you have, uh, on the other hand, uh, a player that you're taking a risk. And, and you're saying, uh, oh, I don't know, but I'm taking a risk and really made an impact. Do you have any stories to share with our listeners? Yeah, I've, I've got quite a few, actually. Uh, I think one that uh, sticks out in my mind is actually a pretty, pretty recent player for St. Leo. His name was uh, Aurel Chukanu. Um, he was fr he's from uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, he came in for, for a tryout, and he was going to see, um, you know, basically the top teams in our conference. Those were only the, the schools that he was considering and he was, yeah, I don't know, maybe at the time he was like an 11 UTR type player. So still pretty solid, but nothing great. He came and did the tryout. He played our number six guy. Our six guy beat him, I think, 6-1, six, 6-0, six, oh, something like that in the, in the tryout. And I, all of our guys, you know, at the end, after he left, he goes, well, coach, you're not going to take him, are you? And I said, yeah, I really like his game. And they're like, you're, you're crazy. And Arell's, you know, he's 6'2", 6'3". Uh, he can hit through his forehand. He, he, he can come to the net, finish off the volley. He needs a little bit of work with his technique, but 
uh, he, he was he took a very professional approach. Um, he had a very professional stretching routine before he even went on the court. Like you could just tell he he wanted to be a good player and he was willing to do what it takes to be a good player. Mm-hmm. Um, his first year he came in, he he injured his hip, and he had to have hip surgery. So he was out the, the whole year. He came back and played a little bit at the end of the season, but not very much at all. He had to go through a lot of, a lot of rehab, a lot of different stretching, everything just to, to be able to get back on the court. And then I think by his junior year um he had beaten the number one player in the country in division two um in straight sets um and he just i mean now now Arell's out trying to play uh futures tournaments uh, the last i knew we, we talked to him about a week and a half ago i think he was down in cancun uh at a futures event but uh but he was kind of the one where you know, he, he, even when I watched his tryout and saw the score, I'm like, this, this is this is still a, a pretty big risk if I'm going to take a guy who's losing to my number six guy to six one. You know, so I, I, I better be right on this kid. And uh, you know, he was one that kind of blossomed. And then we had one time we had a girl come in. Uh, she was from Texas. Um, she just came in as a walk on. Like I wasn't really expecting much from her at all, but uh, you know, we, we, we worked hard with her game. I mean, she mm-hmm. she struggled a lot academically, um, but the, her times on the court, she she would really listen to the coaching, and then uh, she she probably went from being being one of the worst doubles players on the team to she ended up playing number three doubles for us, and she was like the best player on the court pretty much every time we played a match. I mean, she could come into the net. She could serve in volley. She was poaching all the time. I mean, she probably hit 20, 20 winning volleys for, wow. for match that she played in doubles. I mean, she just really, really improved and, and, and took to the coaching. So that was, that was fun to watch. Um, and yeah, I've got plenty of stories about players. I We're thought so would awesome. <laughs> come in and be good, but that didn't, but yeah, we've had a good success with players that uh, a little bit under the radar and, and definitely made a big impact for us. I think it's a great question. With um, History repeats itself. We have a young player from Montreal who just spent three months with us, um, and he's about the same level that you described, great passion. We need to talk to you about him. Um, what you just said, though, a professional approach, I think our listeners, the parents, certainly know this. We're always telling parents that we're telling the children that the parent, your parents have wisdom because wisdom is knowledge with time, but you know, young kids growing up don't have wisdom that the most difficult place to be professional is on a college campus. It's, it's, it's quite difficult. Tell us a little bit about charting. I know, um, Rob Krychek has been a guest. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is, um, is just reinforce, uh, the message. I mean, with people that, um, have, benefited by, by studying the body of work that we've assembled. Uh, remember, Rob, um, I did this because we were helping you build the resume. That's uh, unfortunate, but that's the way it is. It's, you know, we always say credibility um, doesn't mean that you're truthful, just means you're believable. So I remember you tr- charted all these matches for Austin Krychek, who has a very impressive background. One Kalamazoo, he's top 100 in the world. Now he, he's a NC doubles champion. He's a, and now he's a, uh, just recently an Olympian. He just won a tournament in France um, before the before the French Open. Um, you know, Rob said, if I could do over again, I would hire Chad Berryhill because of the information that you had to work with his son. Um, Brian Shelton is somebody um, that uh, you know he took an interest in what we were doing years and years ago, and you charted matches for him. What? Talk to us a little bit about charting. Yeah, I mean that that was a a great way for me to get involved with with high level tennis because I didn't, you know, again I I wasn't going to come to go walk up to someone like Austin and go, hey, do this 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 and this, and he's like, who, you know, who are you or what background do you have? So I really uh, took a liking to charting because I could 
you know, sit down, watch the videotape, do the charting, have the stats, and then you really get a, a completely different feel of a match than, you know, even, even if you're just sitting there and you're watching it, and then if you're sitting there and charting it, it's two different stories. So it was really fun for me to um, have the staff be able to sit down with players and talk about, you know, what their tendencies were, what their stats were, what the, what the stats meant, um, how they can Im- improve. Um, so yeah, I got a chance to, to do some charting for Brian. That was kind of neat to go up and do it for college uh, matches. And I remember going up one time to, to Florida state, um, and helping Matt Kluwer do some charting and teaching is the extra guys at Florida State how to chart, and they were dropping down the the the, the summary sheets to the coaches on the court, and they were kind of taking a look at them on the changeovers to help the players. But it's amazing what stats can do, and um, you just have to know what you're trying to to look for when you're charting. So specifically, when I would travel around with. Um, with your son Connor and in chart, I mean, all of his matches, it was certain things that we would be looking for. So I, I, I know like Connor had a stretch when he was younger that he, he would hit kind of drop shots out of nowhere that were at, you know, bonehead time. So being able to chart and kind of see those types of tendencies and when, when you hit the, the, the drop shot or whatever the shot may be, when you hit it, what was the result? You know, maybe how did it change the momentum in the match? How did it affect the score? Um, and then seeing all the stats at the end of the match to really know how somebody was playing and what was working and um, was a lot of fun. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of work to do the charting, but you get a chance to, to come at somebody from a completely different angle and you're not telling someone what, what your opinion of the match is. You have the, you know, you you have the stake to show them. You this is this is what happened. Um, here's here's what you do, and and, and, and maybe even convincing somebody uh, if they can come to the net more or get more approach shots or use their backhand more that they actually do a better job uh, of, of winning a higher percentage of points by doing those types of things than maybe what they they, they thought they were doing on the court. So. It was just a completely different vantage point to come at it with tennis and and show people how the match was going, what the match flow was like, the the, the, the stats. It was it was a lot of fun for me when I was just learning how I, how to put everything together. No, I know you're a big help to my son Connor. Um, to your credit, many times Connor, you know, teenage boys, uh, they would go, "Did your coach even play?" And Connor you, you <laughs> would use the Vic Braden line and go, "Well." Not really, but I'm sure he's forgotten more about tennis than anybody knows around these courts that we're hanging around. Um, yeah, Brian Shelton, for our listeners, he's at Florida now. He was at Georgia Tech. He's one of the few who has won national championships with both teams. I know uh, Simon Earnshaw has done that, um, and Dave Schwartz has done that. But uh, I mean, there's, there's probably a few others um, that, that actually won national championships. How about foreign players? Um, you know, I think a lot of times I get, I mean, I know I get tired of D1, D1, D1. And Zav, instead of having a kid go, I want to play, you know, you look at home play D1 and, you know, it's very confusing. There's D3 teams that can beat D1 teams and there's almost 5,000 colleges. Um, don't you think that a lot of American kids uh, kind of turn their nose up at Division Two? Yeah, that's, that, that's for sure. I mean, I, I don't know why that is. I think maybe probably the biggest reason is you just, you know, as an American, you grew up seeing these D1 teams on TV, and that's what you aspire to, to, to be, which is great. But if you're not able to have that Power 5 D1 experience, I think the, a D2 experience is, is just as valuable. So for most people, I don't think they really know the differences between the the three divisions. I mean, the Division One level is solely for athletics and winning, and um, all the things that come with winning. So that's that's one experience. Uh, Division Two focuses on having a balance between um, the athletic experience, but also the 
the social, the academic, trying to be a little bit more balanced. Where Division Three is more focused on the academic side. But like you said, there's very, very competitive Division Three schools. Um, but yeah, within Division Two, I think that our, our biggest selling point at, at St. Leo to try to condense uh, players to come is, you know, uh, for our team, we get to wake up every day and try to try to aspire to, to win a national championship. Um, not a lot of teams can say that, especially in Division One. So I think that definitely helps, but I, I think you see a lot more international players in Division II um, because they don't really get caught up as much on the D1 versus D2. They they focus a little bit more on the location. Um, I think they value the, the college experience a little bit more because they're going to come over and th- th- they have to be successful academically uh, to make it work. Um, but yeah, I wish more, more, especially I'll just use in Florida where we are, I, I wish more Floridians would uh, look more at Division Two because I think that they would find you know, it, it's a perfect match for them level-wise and a per- perfect match for them maybe within their own personality. Um, and just because you're a highly competitive tennis player doesn't mean you're not going to get highly competitive tennis in, in Division II. Um, it, it, if you can play at a Power 5 school and you're one of the better players in the country, absolutely have that experience. That, that We can't simulate that in Division Two. But if you're not of that level to play at a, a big time Division One, I, I think uh, the higher level of Division Two, I think a, a lot of people would be quite surprised how good that level is. Um, so yeah, uh, Division Two, even with the academics, I think it's a lot stronger than people give it credit for. With uh, Paul Harros, who went to a, uh, a Division Two school and transferred to Division One school. I mean, he number one player in the world doubles and knocking on the door to be quarterfinals or was in quarterfinals, Grand Slams. There's just so many stories. I mean, blossom where you planted. Um, what about telling players? You know, it's not where you start; it's where you finish. Um, do a lot of tennis players use Division Two to springboard in Division One? I? I mean, I think they'd have to be an impact player in Division Two before someone would even take them. But are there a lot of people that step up from D2 to D1? Yeah, that, that happens quite a bit. I mean, obviously, the the transfer portals changed a lot of the landscape within college athletics. But there are some some rules that make it a little bit uh, easier to initially start at the Division Two level than at the Division One level. Um, so, yeah, we actually see in our conference – uh, probably every year where someone from one school will will transfer up and play at a Division One school. So I think that happens that happens quite a bit, um, depending on the experience that they that they want to have. And, and we've had even at St. Leo um, Division One schools that have sent us players um, either because of an eligibility thing, or you know they're they're not quite sure of the level or even, hey, I just don't have a scholarship for them right now. Um, can you be their home for a year or two? And then if they're playing at the level that you know we think that they should be at, maybe they'll come and play at our Division One school. So, yeah, it happens, it happens a lot, but um, I think it's happening less and less. I think people, once they get to the Division Two school, I think that they, once they see how good the level is and especially in our conference, how good the locations are. Um, they're less likely to, to move, but you definitely see players move up from Division Two to Division One all the time. I can think of a one, one player from our conference last year that moved up and, and played for Alabama this year, and then there was another player uh, that played for a school out west that he moved up and, and played for Wake Forest um, this year. So, yeah, there's... I think people are quite surprised on, on, on how well those players uh, do also from, from D2 and moving up and being key contributors for their team at the big-time Division I, one programs. It really comes down to the work ethic. Uh, I spent a lot of time coaching Rob Steckley, but actually uh, he 
was coached also by Richard Hernandez and Ish Von Toth. Um, as a young kid, uh, he's a great character in tennis. He probably would need to be reminded that he spent his youth at the Richmond Hill program, Richmond Hill Country Club. Uh, but yeah, he he won a Division II title. Story I have, you may have been with us. Uh, do you remember Rich Bonfiglio being with us? Were you there? Oh yeah, absolutely. He, yep. So what a character. So I saw so many Bonfiglio stories. And he was just with us for a semester. And you know now he's a coach at USC. So yep. he's, a, he's a New York, New York guy. And, and Florida Southern was having a re, uh, fundraiser. And part of the fundraiser was a tournament. So Connor, I'm thinking he's 16. 17. He's a junior in high school. I would, I would put money on that. So, and you know, Bon a New York, New York guy. So I'm not there until the last day. And Connor wins the tournament. And, you know, Bon the, you know, some of the, you know, he was fighting some battles from the stands for Connor. It was just rowdy, you know. It, uh, I'm sure that he's grown tremendously. Uh, and he's really climbed the ladder with his coaching career. So but anyway, I remember telling Connor, I said, Connor, it was a reunion. I said, those guys that you were playing were so hungover. Uh, <laughs> it was, you know, so yeah, you beat an All-American, a former All-American in the semis, you beat a former national champion in the finals. Um, but I just remember sitting those guys down and, uh, you know, Don Figlio, uh, such a character. Division two sucks. I go, Bonfico, you're on your way to go to Division three school. And he went, oops. And uh, but no, I, I just think that, you know, D1, 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 uh, the quarterback, Tebow, um, at one time he was, maybe he still is, he was part of the, uh, it's a fitness center, where they call it, I think it's just called D1 Fitness. Um, but I think kids would be, would be so much healthier if they say, I just want to play. I want to just keep playing. And they wouldn't really be hung up on the labels. Um, and then, you know, to actually move up to transfer, um, I think a lot of people, they get connected with the school, connected with the faculty, the, the players, the, just the camaraderie that they would, they wouldn't, they wouldn't transfer anyway. But if, if it came down to here's the criteria, you know, yeah, come on in. And if you are uh, an impact player at Division Two, then you could be considered to go to Division One. Yeah. Tell us about um, the Division Two National Championship. It's quite difficult the way it's set up, correct? It's, um, you have to get through the state of Florida? How does that work? Yeah, it's quite difficult. Um, it, it, so in Division II, um, there's eight regions across the country, and then each region will break off into two separate regionals. So what happens is each region has a set number of, of teams that will make the the NCAA tournament. Um, so for the South region, South region, for example, um, on the men's side, there's eight teams that make it. On the women's side, there's seven teams, and then they split that off into two different two different brackets, basically, um, two different regionals, and then you have to uh, win your your side of the regional to get to the national championship. So at the national championship, which was in San Lando and Altamont Springs this year, um, 16 teams will start two teams from each region. And then once they get to the round of 16, they'll seed all the teams one through 16 based on uh, strength of schedule, head to head strength of their region, uh, things like that. So, Specifically in the South region, um, you know, it's just it's very difficult to to get out of the region just because of the the the, the level strength. So, for example, this year on the men's side, I think we had the number two ranked team, the number three ranked team, number five, number six, number seven, number ten uh, ranked teams in the country, all in the regional. And then two of those get out. And then on the women's side, we have the number one, two, three, five, I think maybe nine, something like that, ranked teams in the country, and only two get out. So um, it, it makes it definitely more difficult in our region just because of the strength of the teams as opposed to when I coached at Ferris State, uh, you know, the Midwest Regional 
still very difficult, but m- much easier to get out of that region than, say, the south region. So uh, I think if you can get out of the south region, you're, you got a, a really good chance to at least make it to the, the semifinals or at least the quarterfinals uh, out of our region. So it's, you know, we've had it a couple years where uh, this year both of our teams are ranked number three in the country, but we, we didn't make it out of our, our regional. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we would have been the highest ranked team not to make it uh, to the round of 16. So that's, that's tough to stomach year after year. But, uh, I mean, obviously you gotta, you got to win and play yourself in, but uh, just getting out of our region is extremely difficult. I heard uh, baseball announcer Kurt Gowdy say one time, uh, I don't care if you win a national championship in tiddlywinks, it's a national championship. Now, that's not really true in junior American tennis because um, democracy is not perfect. So when they created a level two nationals, level three nationals, so now a kid will, will in American junior tennis think they've won a national tournament, but it used to be, you know, okay, we had hard courts, we had clay courts, and then we had an indoor term. That was it. There's just three nationals. Um, so I think people are a little bit confused. You know, they fly all over to get the $1,500 T-shirt that says they played nationals. Um, so the progression, um, you know, obviously you've done well. Um, you know, I mentioned Simon Earnshaw earlier. They're, along with Dave Secker, they're doing well improving tennis at the D1 level. Um, I was on that NC State, North Carolina State campus when he was hired and, you know, a number of people said, well, he won't be able to make it, meaning Simon, he won't be able to make it at this level. Um, you know, I think some of the best coaching is done in Division Three, where there's no scholarships. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, and again, Simon, uh, he, he won nine national titles at Armstrong Atlantic. That's, you know, that's between men and women. I think it was six and three, six with women. Yeah. Um, how about scholarships? I mean, how does that work? I mean, you know the Power Five is eight full for women and uh, 4.5 for, for the men. How about your scholarship distribution? Yeah, so for Division II, um, uh, it would be six, six full scholarships on the women's side, four and a half on the men's side. And then each, each university in Division II really gets to choose if they – are going to be fully funded or not. So specifically at our school, you know, we're, we're not a fully funded program, meaning that we don't have uh, the full allotment of scholarship in athletic money. Um, we do have a couple teams in our conference that are, are fully funded on, on both sides. I would say there's probably only a handful of schools in Division Two that are fully funded uh, both men, men and women, or one or the other. So a lot of the schools will choose if they want to be, you know, seventy-five percent funded or fifty percent funded. Um, however, in Division Two, uh, we can we can combine athletic and academic scholarships, um, or we call it stacking. Uh, so that does help us stay competitive, where we're able to a stack and an academic scholarship with an athletic scholarship uh, to get someone to a, to a higher uh, financial aid package. But the academic scholarships don't count towards the equivalency. And the equivalency really means, um, you know, you can't have more than six people on athletic aid in women's tennis and not more than four and a half on men's tennis so those academic scholarships don't count towards the the six scholarships for the women or the four and a half for the men so um that rule changed a few years ago where you could use the the non-athletic aid and and kind of keep piling it on so there are teams that because of the academic aid or any other um institutional aid that a, a player can have you could have like a women's program with, you know, nine, nine or 10 players on essentially full scholarships. Um, but they're not completely 100% full athletic scholarships. They're a combination of athletic, academic, or any other, uh, university scholarships that they might offer. 
Um, Chad, uh, um, I'm going to move a little bit uh, about leadership. Uh, every team, uh, coaches, were looking for leaders. And what kind of leadership you're looking at your players. And also, um, those players can help you to run the team or can be a problem as well. That's right. Uh, that's right. I, I always try to tell our teams, I, I think the, the very best teams are player-driven and, and player-led. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we, we, we've struggled with the leadership on, on our team um, because some players, they just uh, either A, they don't think it's their responsibility to, to have to be a leader and so maybe it's too late, mm -hmm. or B, they just don't they don't understand that uh, being a leader means that you're not always going to be the most liked person on the team. So we've really spent a lot of time on that. Uh, we, we, we used to have captains on our team. Then we went away from having captains and then we just tried to give people different roles and responsibilities that would, that would ultimately help the team and in, in different areas. But I think anyone that's looking to join a college tennis team, I mean, every coach is going to look for someone that's got leadership traits. Um, people, even even as simple as, you know, I, I, I'm going to text the team about what we're going to wear for the match tomorrow. Or I'm going to remind people to, to stay hydrated or eat well. I mean, all of those little things help, but when it comes to the court for practice and others are keeping each other accountable for you know, are, are all your rackets strong? Are you getting your your your, your overgrip on your racket before you start practice? Is everyone there on time? Um, is everyone getting to the to the the van for the team trip? You know, ten minutes early or whenever the coach asks them to be there. I, th I think those are those are e easy things or things that don't require any talent. They're just things that uh, need to get done and and. We certainly try to work on those types of leadership traits or giving people responsibilities because um, it's only going to help them once they're they're done being on a college team. They're going to need those for the their, their their next employment or their relationship or anything else. So I think that's really important to build the leadership on a team. But if you're if you're someone that's looking to play college tennis, um, I, I, I definitely start reading or looking what that should should be like on a team because every team needs a he needs a leader and, and the more coaches I talk to I think it's they've had a harder and harder time of finding true leaders for their for their team. Roberto that's a great question Chad it's a great answer. Um, yeah you can lead yeah. by example then lead by by word. Let me tell you a, a story that won't mention any names. So when Chad first started working with us that first year, I would say he didn't have autonomy, but after that, he did. Um, you know, it's super organized from day one. Um, and it was a, a situation where the rules allowed us to interface a junior college program with a tennis school, which I don't think that would have worked at the NCAA level or the rules and relegation. So Chad had a player, first year, they win the national championship. They win the individual national championship. Second year, and I, I didn't help Chad out. Um, I had a little fuel to the fire by telling the girl and the girl's father that she was a cancer. She was eating away at the program. So, and she was. So second year, here she is a defending national champion. Uh, Chad um, kicked her off the team. And the athletic director, who really didn't have a, a, a deep background in sports, he reinstated her. So he met, met with Chad and I, ta I talked to him and I said, I wouldn't do that. And, but Chad and I had nothing to do with it. You were there, Roberto, you would remember all this. So, um, but what happened with leadership is the girls on the team, they met with the athletic director and they said, if she goes to nationals, we're not going to nationals. And, um, but I, I can remember when she left, uh, I won't mention the coach's name because that would identify what school she went to. She went to a Power Five conference and her coach said that she was the most, most well-prepared player that he ever had. And um, that was with ball striking. And there's so many stories within the stories that she came in. And, and um, you know, she had done quite well nationally from where she was from. And, 
but she came in and you know just get in line and we're going to teach you how to hit the ball better and again teach you the nuts and bolts and the x's and o's but that's a story where the um, with leadership um with uh let me ask a question chad do you know dave mullins with the ita yeah absolutely does he know your background I don't. I don't know Dave super well. Uh, I, I. I don't think he knows my background whatsoever. I mean, I've talked to him in, in passing a few times, and definitely sat on on calls that he's he's led or moderated or. Um, but no, I don't think he. I don't think he knows my background at all. No, I think he would be interested in that. Uh, I know he came to visit me a couple times, and I was on a podcast with him. He sent some film of his son. Um, you know, I, it's just a serve analysis. Um, but no, he's really uh, uh, in a position, I could think the title is development. Uh, but it would be very, very good for him to know your background, someone like Dave Secker. There's, uh, you know, not many people that, uh, and it's not just Braden, but that have a working handle on, on what we share. Um, but this has been great to talk to you, Chad. We need to wind it down here. Uh, Roberto, you got a question? Uh, just with the, uh, trying to help, uh, we work uh, every day, uh, Chad, with uh, competitive players, and we go in the tournaments. And uh, uh, you, as a coach, uh, so many years, uh, when your players are going to compete, let me ask you this: you uh, you talk with them uh, to play with parents, or you just uh, also see some uh, players that they can. Uh, go with the instincts or have more freedom. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, feel, I feel like I always get into that question with players every semester with our team because we have some players that just, you know, uh, they get really frustrated because I give them some freedom and then they just, they, they might lose the match and coach, I just wish you would give me some patterns. Like I just, that would have made all the world a difference. I just needed a game plan, and I didn't. I didn't. I couldn't figure it out on my own. Where other people on our team, we give them full freedom to play, and they kind of go out and use their own tools. And they're really, I, I just say, they're cerebral players. They're very good about thinking uh, how to break the combination lock of the other player and be successful. But I think we've tried to work on with our our players of um, sitting down, identifying strengths and weaknesses, and then just really try to work on like uh, serve plus one type patterns with them, just so they mm -hmm. kind of, you know, if you're someone that likes to, to use your forehand, um, maybe ways that we can, we can serve and, and, and someone's going to have a higher percentage of them hitting return back to their forehand so they could start the point out that way. Um, but really with my, 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 my training with the great base and just giving people uh, singles concepts and different ways to think of things or just being able to hit the ball deep, things like that, I, I think our players have been more successful uh, with the combination of both, giving them a little bit of pattern and, and kind of knowing what, what they should try to do. But at the end of the day, they're the ones that are on the court that have to uh, think through things and maybe have to play a little bit free sometimes too because I, I think people sometimes when they go in with a, a certain pattern mm -hmm. and it's not working then they kind of fall off the rails because they just expect that 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 one pattern to work 100% of the time so I think it's really uh, understanding what they're trying to do on the court what shots that they're trying to use and then just look for those, look for those shots as much as possible within the realm of uh, directionals or whatever singles concepts you're trying to to teach them. I mean, we're definitely trying to get our players to play more of a, a aggressive percentage tennis. You know, trying to have them play with big targets, but uh, being in control of the point, having the the, the, the match be on their racket, so to speak. So. Um, Man, yeah, we give them a little bit, a little bit more freedom. I mean, that's the beauty of college tennis, though, yeah. opposed to junior tennis. Is I can sit on the bench with them, and if I need to, I can coach them 
at the end of every point, which I don't do, but I, I could. I have 25 seconds mm-hmm. in between the points. So it's, it's, I guess it's very different in that regard, college tennis versus junior tennis, because college coach being on the court and coaching them on the changeover, coaching them after points, it's a lot easier to make some adjustments where a junior player may be the only coaching they're going to get is, you know, if they split sets and they got the break and then they, then they allow coaching that way. So um, I think it just really depends on the, uh, on each yeah. player. Great, great answer, uh, Chad. I'm sure it's going to help a lot, a lot of players. Thank you. Know, you know, one thing within that answer, um, tennis parents and tennis juniors, their idea of a lesson is a basket of balls private lesson and someone feeding the balls and I've very often uh, so I said no I'm giving you a lesson right now you know you could be you know at a sandwich shop and you know this this is a lesson learning is 24 7 Um, with I know I I had Henry Squire uh, I actually was um, on campus for a little bit when he was visiting a German player Andy Fitzell is working with him now Um, and you know, we, you know, we have a Japanese player I just spoke to this evening who, uh, you know, got a case of the maybe ifs where he's, you know, beating someone who, you know, I guess they, he played 10 matches at Florida State this year. So we need to talk to you about him. But when someone says they, they want to play college tennis, they want to play pro tennis, uh, it's kind of like the USTA and the ITF. You know, you know, somewhere along the line, too many parents have been confused here in the U.S. where if you want to be a junior player, you play USTA tournaments. If you want to be a pro player, you play ITF tournaments. But you know, if you want to be a pro player, you can play Division Two tennis. You know, it's 16 weeks in a semester, 32 weeks in a year. What do you do in the summers? And then when you get out of college, you're only 22 years old. You know, so um, I think Henry would have been really beneficial. He went to uh, Wake Forest. For just a semester, I think you would have been very beneficial to. Uh, it would have worked worked if he went to your place and said, "Okay, I'm going to study this content." I mean, it was presented to him when he was six. Um, you know, and his father's a great guy. His father spent a great deal of time with us, um, most with Mark Hamlin, who was trained by us. You know, even uh, you know, a visit or two with Braden. Um, but yeah, there's a few things we need to follow up on. With uh, talking to you about a few players. But Chad, it's been great to have you on. Um, with uh, I loved how you said, uh, once you see it, you can't unsee it. You know, a line of yours I use quite often is, uh, you know, yeah, you've only been here for a month. You know, you could be telling a parent that you really only have a snapshot. Uh, we don't have time to get in how uh, how well does your team play soccer? They probably pretty, play pretty well, right? <laughs> they're, 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 they're definitely very good. They're definitely very good in soccer. Is that true with the women too or not as much? The women are terrible at soccer, but but the the guy. I'm, I'm sure we have a couple of girls coming in that's probably a little bit better. But um, but our, but our guys play our guys play a lot. Um, they're actually pretty good. They're right, you'd be competitive with the men's soccer team, right? We, we've actually used to. We actually are, we had a, a team that used to scrimmage them quite a few times, and I, according to our guys, they've never lost. Um, so yeah, they're they're pretty good. I don't know if they could keep up with Roberto, but. Uh, but they're pretty good. <laughs> no. Chad, I really enjoy uh, having you. And, uh, well, yeah, I'm learning every day. I learned a lot with you today. Thank you. No, that's great, Roberto. I think, and Chad, uh, for our listeners, you have to understand investment hours. Um, so when Chad charted matches for Austin Krychek. Austin was at Nick Ball Terry's. You know, we spent quite a bit of time with him in his uh, early development stages. And, like, here's a stack of his, of his matches. Um, you know, a video, um, ma- video of his matches, and um, that's like okay, burden of midnight oil. But um, Chad was paying his dues. I think that you know, coaches, upcoming coaches, need to realize that um, that it's not just about um, you know how much money am I going to make at this point. Is that you know how much time am I going to invest for a long and successful career in tennis? And uh, 17 years into it, uh, the uh, you know, it's great that you, uh, have, you know, you set out to be a college coach, and that's what you're doing. Um, 
And, and I think to get up every day and say, I'm, this is my job, and we're, you know, you've got teams that are ranked three in the country, and knock on the door to, to win a national championship, um, you're quite content being where you are. It's not like you want to um, jump up and coach D1. It's not, it's not really, once you get established with your family and such, it's not really the same mentality as a kid, right? That's right. I mean, the, 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 having a having a wife and child definitely changed a lot for me. But at the end of the day, too, I mean, I really just enjoyed. I really liked Division Two. I like the, I like the balance. I like the. I, I really don't have any any pressure from our athletic director to to win. I had more pressure to to graduate our our student athletes rather than just to to win win championships. So I, it, it it's. It's more from my, my personality than to have to, you know, fly all, all over the world and recruit all the time and have the pressure of winning and and putting that pressure on my athletes too to win to to keep my job. I, that that that's a tough lifestyle. So for me, being in Division Two and being able to still be very competitive, have a good balance, still be able to focus on my on my family and we, my wife's parents and my parents, they both live about an hour from us so it's, it's been great to, to our student athletes to have that balance with academics and athletics and, and same thing for me as a coach to have a balance with my family and, and then also uh, get my fix with competitive tennis No, you're a team guy so it, you know, I think that some people just they get that in their blood that they have to be part of a team uh, one thing I uh, when years gone by, I gave you a lot of things to do. I haven't done that here lately. So here's something that I'd like to ask you to do is that if you could find out who needs to be written, and first of all, Colin Cadwell at Ferris State, he should have applied years ago to be the director. I mean, yeah. I remember he was on the staff. Maybe that was when you were on the staff or even before or after, and that he should have applied to be the director. But I, I, if you could get me the name of the person I could write for that, but I think also if you were to call it Kyle Lacroix, and you yourself, I mean, uh, he is the person for that job. I mean, teaching is information transfer, and his heart is huge, and he's just the right guy for the job. So, Gary Hill, I'm giving, yeah. you, I'm giving, you, something, I'm giving you something to do. You got it. It can be done. You know, that one thing for our listeners is Barry Hill would have this uh, legal pad, the one that I have in front of me, and... Uh, we could use a burial. I remember uh, when we sent you off to Harvard, I'm going, oh, we need that guy because of all the variables, <laughs> airport runs and this and that. And, and uh, I said, burial, this would be good, good for you to do. And uh, we'll survive this summer when you can go and come back. But uh, all the best to you, your family. Have a great summer. And uh, I know our listeners will uh, greatly enjoy this podcast. So thanks, thanks, thanks. No, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Roberto. It's great to catch up with you both. I'll have to come and visit. Uh, sometime soon. Always great to hear what you guys are doing and uh, keep 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 fighting the fight uh, with tennis. Yeah. We need you. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. All right, Chad. Good night. All the best your family. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Another podcast in the books. I was going to say adios amigos, but adios I don't think amigos. I don't think you understand that. You understand that? No, no, no. What you do it. You got it. You got it. <laughs> with. Uh, yeah, the, it would have been fun to talk to him a little bit more about the soccer. But it, yeah, St. Leo, be, beautiful place, and uh, fun to talk to him. Uh, the uh, been hard-working guy, and uh, we believe in Chad. We believe that uh, Great. he'll, he'll uh, win a national championship. Uh, he did it at the NJC level. I think he'll do it um, where he is now. But that's secondary. What's primary is uh, just helping people with tennis is a light vehicle. All right, Cala, listeners. Yeah, thanks for listening. Adios, amigos.